So this meeting is being recorded. Well, if we're ready, 7.30, so we'll go ahead and call this to order. We need to do introductions. There may be some guests, so we'll find out who they are when they come up to speak. I think we're good. Item two, approval of the minutes from our last meeting, February 9th. So moved. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. First item, 3-1, U.S. Highway 54. Mr. Bangy. Yes, thank you. Um, so last uh, meeting, we had talked about the possibility of um, the council supporting one of the options that MoDOT had presented uh, regarding the keeping of uh, RAM um, from Highway W onto 54. And so at the time, the question was raised whether or not we had um, vetted that uh, idea with the property owners and business owners on the north side of the river. And so, uh, in the time since then, that's what we have done. We worked with uh, the Chamber of Commerce to contact all the businesses on that side of the river uh, and ask them their opinion on, on the options. And so, what you're seeing on the screen is the, the two different options that MoDOT had presented, um, options two and three, as they called them, uh, for getting the traffic from Highway W back onto 54. And so uh, there was also option number one, which was the elimination of the ramp, which the council had already um, indicated to MoDOT that they didn't want to see. So in the responses that we got, we didn't get a ton of responses from the folks uh, over there. Uh, we did hear from the farmer companies, which basically operate four different companies, the sand plant, the um, concrete place, uh, and various, all kind of operating out of that one little quadrant. But their opinion was that they probably preferred um, uh, option three over over the other options. The MFA folks also responded and indicated they probably preferred option two. But uh, in saying that, their probably their preferred option, if it was an option, was to expand the river bridge and allow the ramp to stay as it is currently. Uh, we also heard from Grant Shorthose uh, at the airport, and he was in support of uh, what was shown as the option number three. Uh, and I believe that Ed Story, uh, who I think owns some of the billboards in that area, was also in support of option three. So those are the folks that we heard from. But uh, in terms of, you know, choosing option uh, two over three or three over two, in some ways, it's probably not the, the main focus of the question in that if you look at the screen, I've what I have there is in dark blue is what uh, MoDOT was showing as option three, and in light blue is what was shown as option two. And then, as you can see, the yellow and red lines are basically uh, creating the, the curves uh, from the options two and three and tying them to the opposite option. And so, ultimately, I think that's just a, a, a question of geometry and final design. So. Either one of those options could basically represent the other, depending on how you were to design them. So I think the real question is is not option one or two. It's the question or two or three. It's the question of do we use Fourth Street or do we not use Fourth Street? Um, and so I think that is the the question that we probably want to answer uh, in our response. Um, and so obviously, if we choose what Modoc calls option two. We are using 4th Street and we basically stay off of the majority of the property that's owned by the city. There would be a small piece up where 4th Street runs into W that would that would obviously need to be taken. And then a small piece down by the highway, um, whereas option three is taking up a much larger uh, piece of of cities of the city's property. I think the, the difference between them then is, you know, how does that traffic interact with the other parks uses in that area? Um, you know, obviously, if we're using 4th Street, then that impacts 
um, you know, how those little ball fields are being used. It, it affects the access to the Katy Trail um, and creates a, a different environment there because now you'd have cars that are basically looking to accelerate, uh, you know, to get to the highway, whereas now 4th Street is basically a dead end. So, you know, I think it kind of changes the dynamics there. So, uh, from staff's point of view, um, keeping that traffic that wants to make it to the highway separate from 4th Street, we think that's, we think there's a value in that. Um, and so, again, with the geometry options that we have, um, it appears that, you know, supporting option three, which means not using 4th Street is still the best option for us. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, Councilman Spencer. So with option three, mm -hmm. is there still a possibility to keep that parking um, as, as some commuters, commuter parking? Um, MoDOT, I suppose, could choose to do that. Um, that would be a little irregular, um, but, you know, so, you know, accessing it would some would have to come from the on ramp. And so you would have to use the on ramp uh, to get to it. And then you would have to exit the parking lot onto the highway to leave. But I, it's already it's, there. It's possible, yeah. but uh, it would be irregular. Okay. Just a question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Councilman. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in adopting option three, would all that would all the parkland go to MoDOT? All that land that currently is city there. Correct. Everything between Highway W and Fourth Street, which is kind of that triangular section there, all that is city-owned property. Um, and you know, ultimately, that they if option three were chosen that sort of upper little triangle that would be above the dark blue line wouldn't necessarily have to go to MoDOT. But I would assume that MoDOT would want um, everything um, inside the what would be the the ramp at that point, which would include the majority of the parking lot. And my understanding is parks is fine with that. I did have an opportunity of going to the parks commission meeting last uh, month or some weeks ago. And discussed it with them. They had some questions. Um, ultimately, um, we're looking uh, perhaps for some compensation for the relocation of the existing playground equipment and other park amenities that remain there. Uh, and I think there was some notion also that, you know, if MoDOT were to ever not need that ramp, um, that the property would come back to parks as sort of a stipulation for the donation. So, um, yeah, so those were kind of the questions that were raised at the, the parks meeting. Mr. Moresh, just going to point out, I chatted with a gentleman here from Hitachi and, and Ashley's here from Hitachi. I don't know if other people are here on the issue, but they're, uh, he was just wanting to wanted to know what, what we were uh, talking about. And I think he relayed to me that, uh, you know, they were concerned if the, the ramp went away that we, with their entrance, then having more traffic at it. So just you can speak for yourself, but that's mm -hmm. just wanted to point out he's here and listening. And I did see somebody from MFA somewhere back there. It's here. I don't know if anybody else is here on the issue or not. <clears throat> Go ahead. You have to come up to the microphone. Mm -hmm. Just introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm Jeff Ballers. I'm just a resident uh, listening in on this. Um, so that's an off ramp coming back onto 54, correct? Is that the off ramp behind it coming off from Columbia then where that little car is? Correct. We got a lot of traffic coming out of Columbia back into Jeff City during the day. Is that going to create a bottleneck for them trying to get over to the next lane and people coming off into whichever way you do that ramp back on there and trying to figure out how to merge and all that? What's the uh, sight distance or? The distance between those two that, you know, is that going to give them enough uh, room to merge over real quick? And then, you know, how it is in the summertime with lake traffic. Um, mm -hmm. Just something I just saw just looking at it. So mm -hmm. thank you all very much. MoDOT has actually done modeling of that. I don't know if someone wants to speak to that, but they had a fairly detailed modeling that mm -hmm. at least in that little diagram showed that there was right. ways for that. Right. I get the term yeah. they used. 
Right. So on the screen now is basically you can kind of see that uh, there's a what's shown in green, red, and yellow. So right now the 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 red and green essentially are the right of the the this is the road coming from Holt Summit, and what will happen is those lanes will actually shift towards the middle, and so the green line it actually will be a new lane that's built into the median. And the yellow line essentially will be coming would be the off ramp from Columbia and it would then occupy what is now the outside lane of highway 54. And so the folks coming from Columbia would have their own lane all the way across the bridge. The, there, the, the five, the 10,000 cars that are coming off of that ramp every day would have their own lane and they would no longer need to merge into the 54 traffic as they would have their own lane. The highway, the W ramp, which is shown in blue, um, it has a volume of 1,783. And so, yes, those folks using that ramp would now have to merge into uh, the ramp coming from, or the folks coming from Columbia. Whereas in the old version with the ramp the way it is currently, that the highway W ramp has its own lane all the way across the bridge. and so. The difference is we're trading the merge of 10,000 cars with the merge of 1,700 cars. Mm -hmm. Councilman Kim. So as far as a decision for two or three, I mean, is this where you just want to make a recommendation to MoDOT as far as what our preferred choice is in this matter? Because with the discussions with them, are they open to, to say, hey, hey, if we choose one of them, or is that how much of a, how much teeth is that going to have? Um, with them? I don't know the exact answer to that question. I did speak with James Beattie, who is the, um, the project manager for MoDOT, and he was interested in knowing what we as a, as a city thought uh, and was looking to get our opinion now. What, what that would lead to, I don't know, but they were looking for us to, to weigh in on the matter if we would choose to do so. I mean, if that's, I mean, if that's the case, if we're looking at the two, I mean, I'm leaning more in favor of the one where we, we don't use 4th Street, um, just so that we can keep that as a, for people using the Katy Trail to have open access to the parking lot. Um, I mean, that would be my preference at, at this point um, for, for this. You know, I, I guess I, I agree with that. The only thing I, I was going to raise is that blue line is a definite right turn, correct? I mean, that's not a, you're gonna have to slow down quite a bit to make make that turn. Yeah, so the the blue, the dark blue line is, I think a radius of about 235 feet. And the light blue line has a radius of about 180 feet. And so certainly the radius, the tightest point of the radius on the light blue line uh, would, force you to drive more slowly through the radius, but it's, it's uh, basically it's a spiral curve. And so it actually flattens um, before it gets to the highway. So just doing some uh, quick looking at what the potential speeds could be um, at, you know, at the point where both the dark blue and the light blue hit the highway, those speeds are actually very similar to each other. Um, and certainly the distance, the acceleration distance that you have along the highway a vehicle could be at 60 miles an hour by the time they get to the end of the acceleration ramp. So, um, and, and again, it's a little, each vehicle is a little bit different. Certainly a truck is going to accelerate more slowly, uh, a loaded truck as opposed to a, a passenger vehicle. Um, and so I think that was probably some of the, the difference in the discussion between uh, the folks at MFA and, and the sand plant folks. Um, with, I think the sand plant folks tended to like the larger radius because they thought their trucks could could acquire and maintain a higher speed around the radius um, rather than going through the tighter radius of the light blue line. But again, because it's a spiral, um, the speeds are about the same when you hit the, when you get to the highway acceleration ramp. Well, my question relates to, since you're gonna have to slow down so much to make that right, and I know it would require using 4th Street, but if you went somewhere between the dark blue and that light blue at the top, that would preserve preserve most of the pavilion. I know the pavilion's gone, but it would preserve 
most of that, you'd have to use 4th Street to be able to accomplish what they're trying to do. Um, yeah, certainly, certainly 4th Street could be used. Um, the, I, I think, think from our, what we were considering when we were thinking about it is that, you know, if 4th Street is used, then the kind of the nature of that street changes. Um, you know, even though it would be too, it would remain two way essentially to the point where the, the curve starts to come back towards the highway. Um, the vehicles that would be using it, um, probably the larger majority of them now would be vehicles attempting to reach the highway. And so they would probably be looking to accelerate uh, along there, whereas now that street is sort of a, a driveway to a parking lot. And so folks generally aren't going very quickly. And so it's, it, I think it's a change both in the, in the number of cars that would be on 4th Street and probably also the velocity and speed of those cars. Um, certainly, you know, if we talk about, you know, access to the Katy Trail, you know, certainly something could be done about that right now. Um, you can kind of see going off to the, to the upper right hand corner of the picture is the spur that leads to the Katy. Um, you know, if that parking lot, uh, well, regardless of the parking lot, certainly that spur could be relocated somewhere else. You know, it could file perhaps follow oil well road um, and perhaps even be more direct and, and logical connection between Jeff City and the Katy. Um, and so perhaps that that's not the biggest issue, um, but certainly. Um, you know, using um, right now, the use would change. I mean, the, currently there's people who pull off the side of the road and, you know, park and their kids get out and go practice T-ball or whatever, you know, that would, that would probably change. And, you know, if we use 4th Street and the parking lot, which would preserve the parking area, perhaps, um, the people who would then be parking in the parking lot would then need to cross what is a basically the, you know, the on-ramp traffic, you know, so that's not probably if you had the, had to choose that might not be the the best thing again because those folks are trying to you know speed up to get to the highway so um but those are those were the thoughts that we had as staff as we were looking at it it just seems a shame you lose all that parkland if we can readjust but mm -hmm. i get it every time you readjust it causes a new problem mm -hmm. the comments questions Just identify yourself, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come on up. Cindy Frank, Jefferson City. Um, I wasn't aware of this was going on, and it was a shock to me this morning. Um, as a resident that uses that commuter parking um, for travel, for work, um, losing the parking lot, I don't think, is an, issue, uh, an option. Um, I think that there's quite a number of people, if you drive by that parking lot, it's full. And then when they do have ball games there, um, it's very crowded. I mean, there is, and so I have no idea what the plan is for, for you being able to utilize those fields over there. But I don't understand why that's necessary when there is an on-ramp on. I do agree that the extra lane is the most important thing that we want to do. And are we just doing this for farmers concrete? The Rod W ramp is proposed to be eliminated. So, I mean, we're doing it for everybody in that area. I mean, there's a lot of traffic that leaves the airport also. If you go to option one, which is not up there, it's a really complicated two loops to get back west or south on 54. So that's why we we're working with MoDOT to try to find a different route to do it because they are adamant that they want to eliminate the Route W ramp, which is currently there. Right, and you can kind of see it in this picture. Um, this is kind of grayed out. So this this part of the W ramp that exists today is being proposed for being is is planned to be removed. And the reason the reason for that is to um, uh, is to allow for the what is now the outside lane to be used by the traffic coming from Columbia. 
uh, right now, if if that ramp were to remain in place, there wouldn't be any acceleration lane for it. Uh, you would come to the end of the ramp and you would immediately have to enter into the traffic lane. So that's the the reason for its proposed removal. No, right now you would come down that ramp and there's a the there's the third lane across the bridge is your lane at that point. So you can come down the W ramp and then you have a lane all the way across the bridge. That lane would now go be dedicated for the 63 traffic. So are you looking for something to push forward to council at this meeting? Or I know MoDOT, it's not like next week, but within a few months, I think they're wanting to start pulling some of this together. So kind of what's our time frame? MoDOT has been very quiet. Um, I haven't gotten a lot of information from them. Um, we would have supposed that by this time, perhaps they would have put together the public comment that they had they themselves had received. Um, but we haven't received any information from them uh, in that regard. So I'm not for sure, Ron, what the what their plan is. Okay. Good morning. Morning, Mel Calal, Jeff. Uh, I want to bring to the attention one caveat that I became aware of regarding the proposed loop. First of all, I say my preference is to do nothing. But if we have to do something, then I think we have to do a little more work. There is a caveat or let's see, the attorney is here. The attorney, are you are you familiar with the uh, deed restrictions in that area as far as putting in new hard stand? How does that have a bearing on that new road? It, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't. The type, this type of public infrastructure wouldn't be wouldn't be uh, inconsistent with the deed restrictions. So it's, it doesn't it doesn't fit the current deed restrictions. No, it, it 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 would be in line. This this type of project would be allowable under the deed restriction. What are the restrictions? They allow public stuff as opposed to others. It's it's essentially to be maintained as open space, which roads are are consistent with open space. Well, the permeability that was uh, an existence on some of this doesn't apply to this. Not in this particular instance. Thank you. Thank you. I'm objecting to the plan. I think we should do nothing. Well, I appreciate those comments. I think doing nothing probably we've got problems on the, the opposite side, which is where we initially started and in trying to address some of the traffic on that loop. And I think we're realigning some roads up near Itachi. So there's a lot of things on the, I guess that's the east side of it. And then MoDOT come back with, well, if we're gonna work on this project, let's do the whole thing. So that's what we've been trying to, to negotiate, but we definitely need to do some changes on the east side, the money is there. and. I think MoDOT's preference would be that we do it all. You know, it may come down to just doing part of it, but we're trying to work it out where we can help solve problems on both sides. So that's kind of the conundrum that we're in right now. But CAMPA, the local metropolitan planning organization, has done a lot of work to get this project off off of the unfunded projects into a funded. So we're trying to come up with something that meets the needs of everybody. Other comments from the committee or action? What's, what's your preference? And obviously if it goes to council, it will have continued debate, but I would want to move it until people are ready. I would like to uh, get the uh, public comment from MoDOT first, if that's if that's going to be an available option uh, to kind of see uh, what, what their data shows. And then I think I think this committee should uh, make a, a recommendation uh, for the full council just for, for what we do and what our process is. So, um, but 
Mr. Bain, do you have an idea maybe when that public comment might be available? Um, I can certainly surprise that it wasn't available even now. Correct. But, but certainly I can get in touch with uh, with James and 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 see if we can't get a hold of that information. OK, mm -hmm. I'm myself, I'm leaning towards option three, but, um, you know, I know there was a, an opportunity for a lot more public comment and input. So I think that would be valuable data to help us uh, make a more solid recommendation. Thank you. So between the lines, you're saying we probably ought to wait till next meeting when we get some additional information. I would feel more comfortable with that approach. Yes, sir. Councilman. You comfortable with that? I'm, I'm fine with that. Just, uh, want to be sure we get a uh, recommendation in before MoDOT acts. Yes. This is your ward, correct? That's correct. Yes. Councilman. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm fine with that too. And I, and like I said. Earlier, I would be more inclined to go with option three at this point um, with the information that we currently have. Um, I mean, I'll have to address, you know, if we if we do that, we're taking out possibly that whole parking. So we have to to to, to address that. And that's that's a concern um, because, like you mentioned, you know, it, it, it gets a lot of use. So but as far as the plans that are in front of us, I think option three makes the most sense as plans go, you know, at this point. So but yeah, I'm I'm fine with. You know, seeing if MoDOT reaches out to you. I know it's been difficult, but um, see if they give you some more information on that. So thank you for your work. Thank you. All right. We will push that to the next, to the April meeting. Hopefully we'll have additional information. But I think staff will do. I don't see MoDOT moving that quick on it, but they'll keep their eye on it. All right, let's go to an easy topic. Let's go to three, two and talk about parking. Is that you, Mr. Smith? Well, uh, as the agenda notes, the, the item A is, uh, you know, after some previous discussion, we thought it was appropriate for just basically get some feedback from the committee. And then there's been some concerns in reference to uh, rates um, in especially the fines related to 10 hour meters. So thought that it was appropriate to have a discussion on that. And then, you know, as for a report on the payment app, I can say that it is going very well. We've received quite a bit of uh, positive feedback from our customers. Uh, we're getting somewhere between 50 and 60 uh, uses a day. You know, that's anecdotal. I haven't run the reports, but when I log in and check to see how the, the uses are going, so I, I think the payment app is going well. We've we've run into a couple of glitches and we're working through those with our vendor. Uh, nothing major, but uh, uh, and nothing that you wouldn't expect whenever you're instituting a new plan. We're getting 50 to 60 a day. How, how many meters did we begin with in that area? Well, that's actually across our entire network of because you know you can use the payment app on right. any meter. Uh, primarily, they're in that. Uh, Capital Avenue area, and I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's the the primary use is in the Capital Avenue and Broadway, or not Broadway. Excuse me. Well, actually, Broadway is a high use area, but it's the two hour. Uh, but uh, Jefferson, Capital Avenue, and Jefferson is our primary use. All right. Well, let's go back to a garage committee feedback partnerships with the state. What where are we going with that? Well, so last uh, council meeting, we had a discussion about the parking garage, and you may not have been there. Uh, anyway, I don't think you were around. Yeah, I was not there. Uh, but anyway, uh, at that time, uh, uh, they kind of uh, wanted to indicate they wanted to talk more with some state agencies, Missouri Development Finance Board. I always, that's a hard acronym for me. <laughs> Uh, we've been trying to contact that fellow, myself, Britt, and Ryan. Uh, Britt's traded some reports with him. He wanted some more information. We got that to him uh, this week. And he's still trying to, we're still trying to get on his schedule to get him here to speak with the council. Yeah, we're actively coordinating with him, trying to find an available time. Um, we're trying to hone in on the 20th for now, but we'll, so you got a couple of balls up in the air to uh to, to work that out but that's uh that's what we're targeting right now but that that's kind of 
where we're at on it. Uh, you know, we, I think all the reports are there. Uh, it's just, we need to make a decision on which way to move on this. And uh, I think we had talked about in the past, uh, you know, kind of a two tracked option, you know, working still with Missouri development finance board. If, but if that happened to not come to fruition, you know, we're several months in, we've wasted several months of time, not pursuing other, you know, uh, city tract as well. So just want to point that out. So, uh, you know, that, that would be my recommendation to keep it kind of going on two tracks. I don't think either one, uh, hurts the other one in any way. And, uh, so that, that's, that's an option. Of course, the garage, you know, it's not in good condition as we've all pointed out and had all the reports say. So, uh, I know with the construction going on around it right now, I heard from our, our manager up there, you know, we're, still have issues with concrete chunks and this and that coming coming loose just with the vibration of all that's going on around it with the uh, pipeline construction so um, so that's we're we're kind of looking for some direction of how we want to proceed there and just kind of committee up to date in the public it's almost a half of a city block so there's just a lot of complicating factors within that area that we're trying to consider where parking is a challenge in downtown and we're trying to figure out what's the best way to accomplish it long term there's just a lot of factors going into it but we are working on it as mr marash indicated it's kind of a dual track looking at all options before we make any serious moves we did make an action item in regard to the jefferson street how's how's that project going with that deck so now uh, we have some we have a contract uh that is being reviewed by our consultant and it should appear on the, the march 20th council agenda for approval uh for that work uh and it would be uh, desirable to do a check mark on that if if at all possible but uh we're still waiting for feedback from the, the proposed contract <clears throat> excuse me from the from the consultant i would hope to have that this week but what? Yeah, I think that would be, uh, I won't speak for the other council, the other council members here, but we've had a lot of discussion on that. So it would be reasonable to think that we could do that. Any other discussion on first item A in regard to just general parking garages? I see, I see there's a, a letter from, uh, Historical Society uh, point is on the agenda. I don't know. It is. It's it's one of these other items. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna okay. get to that. Right. Item B. You kind of filled in on on the payment app. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to add there, other than it. I, I, as I said, I believe very well. The only thing I would add to that, and I think I sent a picture over. You seem to have a lot of orange tags popping up on Capitol Avenue all of a sudden. So I'm not, it seems like we just kind of rerouted our problem and made it convenient for people that continue to want to use it. And the, the goal of that was to hopefully open up parking in that area for short term use at the Capitol, the mansion, and, and other places. And it seems like we've created an opportunity for some to utilize. Parking there all day that have parking available to them. So is that a misread of what I'm seeing up and down Capitol? Uh, certainly, when we made it a 10 hours, you know, we can't make it a 10 hour zone for, you know, it's a public parking. So if the, yeah, okay. you know, the, the rate is the only deterrent, and, uh, you know, if you will, and uh, the, the, those customers, as you note, have started coming back into the zones. Um, Believing that the rate is still, I think it's much less than it was to, to, to be clear, but uh, I, I personally wouldn't pay $10 a day to go to work, but they, some people are choosing to do that. We've heard some, we've heard some anecdotal, just, you know, rumorish more than less, but, you know, people, well, it's towards the end of the day, our lunchtime, I'll go ahead and move my car over at that time. 
uh, so not pay all day, but maybe half a day or a couple hours that they go out on a walking break or something, move their car, and then they know they're going to be right there and take off. So, I mean, that's their prerogative. It's, you know, still a dollar an hour. So, I, yeah, I realize it's a free enterprise and people can, but it, it seems like it it was counter to the cooperation we were trying to get with the state of Missouri since several of us have been called to the Capitol to address parking challenges for people coming to see people in the Capitol. And I walk over the Capitol early in the morning, I see them up and down both sides. So they're there a good share of the day. Anyways, I think it's something we're going to have to address. I mean, I don't know that we want to price people totally out of the market, but I agree. I mean, it's it's an open parking spot. It's available to anybody. It's just we're trying to address issues within the capital. We're going to have to have some cooperation, I would think. And uh, on the, I had a call from one of the representatives at the uh, state that they were interested in what we were doing with pedestrian movements and things on Missouri Boulevard with the High Street Project and. And I brought that issue up to them about parking and uh, visitors to the cow. I said, you know, it kind of goes together. And, uh, you know, your issue of state employees crossing the road and being in a dangerous situation the way they're doing it. And also just, you know, if a, a, a parking garage closer by that they might build <laughs> would that help that and then also help the issue of the uh, visitors issue. And I, so I said, you know, I, I hear a lot about the visitor issue too, uh, from others. And so I said, our, our council is concerned about that and just let him know. And he said he would be a partner and do what he could with us. So. But if they build public parking in what they're building, which is the proposal, they're going to have the same challenges unless they figure out some way to oh, yeah. police it. Well, the last week or so in the kettle, it's, Pre COVID activity, I mean, there's a lot of people in the capital, so parking is going to continue to be a challenge till mid May. Uh, that's actually, you know, demand wise, we are seeing a demand. It's don't know that it's exactly the same as COVID, but it's, it's, you know, pre COVID, excuse me, but it's very similar. It's uh, pretty close. There were a lot of groups in there this week, a lot of school buses, which is really nice to see. Yeah, I was participated in a day at the Capitol for the association that I'm with and. I was amazed at the number of people that were in the Capitol that day. Uh, and to that end, you know, as, as the committee, I should have stated this earlier, level 4C, we've had closed out of an abundance of caution. We worked with our consultant and uh, develop a plan that we could open that back up with the loss of six spaces on that level. So we're hoping to have that opened up. Uh, if not uh, later today, it'll be uh, by Monday. So. Well, there House is on spring break next week. I'm not sure what the Senate's doing because they posted that they were back in session next Wednesday. So should be a, a more limited problem next week, but we'll be right back at it the week after. Any other comments on this that kind of leads into item C, which you referenced, Councilman, in regard to rates, fine structure? So well, let's let staff make their presentation and then we'll talk about it. Is anything else you wanted to talk about on that? I know there's a document in our packet. Right. Uh, you know, just, just as a reminder of the cap, when we, we raised the rate uh, to the dollar an hour, the, the uh, fine for an expired 10 hour meter at that time was $10, but it didn't make much sense to have the $10 fee equal to the actual cost to feed the meter because people would just basically choose to not feed the meter. At that time, the fine was raised and we also have 10 hour meters that are quarter an hour, 50 cents an hour, and a, and a dollar an hour. So we tried to tie it to the rate uh, that the, uh, the, the meter had. Uh, so, the, so what was chosen, uh, decided at that time, was that we would charge whatever it would be to feed the, that meter for the day, 10 times the, the rate, plus $20 as the fine, to encourage people to actually feed the meter. Uh, not necessarily to correct re collect revenue from the fine, but to make it ensure it's a deterrent to people to actually use the meter. So in the 10 hour zone in Capitol Avenue, where it's a dollar an hour, that fine is 30 currently $30 a day. 
quarter an hour down on McCarty Street, uh, it's 2250 a day, or 2250 is the fine. So that's the current range of fine for a 10 hour meter. Okay. Well, I know we've got people interested in this. We've got a section to back of the agenda for public comment, but with the committee trying to make some action on some of these things, it probably makes sense. If people do have comments, if you want to make them now, we'll try to filter that into our discussions. I don't know that we have an action item for today, but there's some things that the staff has requested we take a look at. So are there individuals that are interested in talking on this topic, parking in this area? I know you come up, we're, we're and then just reintroduce yourself, please, for people listening that aren't aware that you've been up here. Thank you. Mel Kella, Jeff. Uh, two or three points. First of all, I wanna I wanna continue to praise the uh the uh, street department because we have to keep in mind, and I'm sure you do this, that whatever you do down there, they have to come in uh, early and handle snow removal. Uh, I'm sure that's got to be a hassle, and they do an amazing job through the whole city. So I want to say that. Uh, just a little, I'm kind of a detail nut. I think we want to solicit as much comment from our visitors in the area, particularly the ones coming in for the legislature. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the uh, we have some way of priding. Uh, a black and white sheet that we would distribute to folks that normally would park there with a little explanation of what our plans are and where they are choices to park. Maybe they already know this, but it wouldn't cost much to do that. So it's just something to think about for the committee. It would be an information sheet of their options are and so forth. And I have other questions, but I'll deal with those uh, in the future because I think this is more important. Thank you. Thank you. We had someone else want to speak. Yes. Just identify yourself. We've got a number. Of, come up the microphone. We've got a number of people online, so you can just identify who you are. Thank you for being here. You may want to just pull the mic down just a little bit. The gentleman before you was kind of tall. Okay. I've not been here before. I don't know what procedure is. Just. Uh, Talk to us like we're having a conversation. Okay. Uh, it's regarding the 100 block of mm -hmm. Madison Street. And I have uh, written a letter. I have copies. Do I need to send pass those? I around? think we all got the letter, I believe. I... No, I've not sent a letter in. Oh, okay. We did receive a letter on this. So... Not from me. Well, from uh, the American uh, okay. Surgeon. Thank you. I just assume that's one that we'd already received. Okay. Thank you. This is fresh off of the print this morning. So. Nice. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm representing myself, my feelings, and of course, all the people that are listed below me. I have been in contact with. They are in agreement with my letter and uh, want to support what I am asking for. In that letter. And, uh, should I read the letter or? I, I don't think when you need to unless okay. you feel like you want to. I mean, we've got it in front of us. Well, I just, uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, in recent months, the parking meter rates in the 100 block of Madison Street have risen from 25 cents to a dollar per hour, with fines reaching as high as $30. The current rates will surely negatively affect both the Governor's Mansion and the Cole County Historical Society Museum, visitors, docents, and other volunteers. These organizations work many hours to continue to retain the preservation of what they feel so very important, the histories of the Cole County and the state of Missouri. All on the list below, sincerely hope 
public works department will not only appreciate, but understand our reasoning and join us in our efforts by returning rates to their original prices. They could also consider extending the removal of parking meters in the 100 block of Madison, <clears throat> as was done in the 100 block, in the, I'm sorry, in the 200 block of Madison, and also the shopping dining areas of High Street. Not to be ignored, but considered, as businesses within walking distance may very well benefit from both the Governor's Mansion and Cole County Historical Museum's tours, whether they be local or out of town visitors. Sincerely submitted, concerned citizens, and as you can see below, I have contacted all of these people uh, by fax, by phone, Facebook. They have all given me yeses, agree with my letter, and uh, I feel strongly it should be considered. Well, we appreciate you presenting that. I'll just make one comment. You reference Public Works Department. They provide us information, but the decision is made by council, so we'll take the monkey off their back. But okay. you know, they provide. We asked them for information. They provide us, and and we made some decisions based on the earlier comments. I mean, we've got severe parking challenge that we're trying to address. I appreciate I appreciate your comments. I think when these changes were made, there were public notices that went out to that area, and that, it doesn't impact. I mean, we can still take a look at what we did and, you know, reconsider, but we tried to contact every business in that area. I know my office is at 200 East Capitol. So, I mean, we got, or we're at 211 East Capitol. We got and everybody up and down that area. So hopefully you guys had a chance to at least respond when we were looking at what we were gonna do in that area. It's not you guys, it's, it's just me because I've had friends uh, complaining about uh, getting the, uh, the tickets and the cost of the tickets. And um, I, I got in touch with, as you can see there, the friends of the Governor's Mansion, Tammy Holiday. they're concerned. Uh, Missouri uh, uh, Mansion, Sherry Childs, director. And you can see that there are other names here. Yeah, yeah. I well, I'm saying everybody in that area was the historical society. Everybody would have been notified that we were looking at making changes. Again, that doesn't mean a change put in and then we reassess and we appreciate you bringing that to us. And we will include that as part of our discussions as we continue to look at this whole area. You probably heard our conversations that the changes we made on East Capitol didn't really have the effect that we were looking for. So we're going to have to continue to look at parking well, the, in that area. And the business is in the 200 block. Uh, I spoke with uh, Tony at Stiefel Nicholas. I spoke uh, with uh, River City Florist, Madison. Oh, you're, you're talking about 200 block Madison. Yes, yeah. they have no meters there. Correct. There is. They don't understand why 100 block has meters. So I'm not sure about that. I don't. I think that decision was made before I got on council. I, I don't know what the strategy was, but yeah, there are some there that that one, the 200 block, as you indicate, does not. And a couple blocks on High Street do not. So. Councilman Spencer. Good morning. Thank you for appearing this morning, and sharing your concerns. Um, you're somewhat affiliated with Cole County Historical Society. Is that is that I am? Yes. OK. Do you have an idea of, of, you know, how many parking spots you would require on a daily basis? I mean, it doesn't have to be exact, obviously, just to give us an idea. I really can't speak for the Cole County Historical Society. I just, uh, but I do think that um, there are going to be visitors this summer wanting to do the tours. And uh, I know that they are not open every day but if there could be a limit possibly of how many hours you can park there, or if we could have, uh, this is just an idea. I've seen in other towns, other places where you can put something over a meter uh, and, and it tell you that, you know, that this is only for the uh, 
historical mansion tours, uh, those historical society tours, and we would just put those on on the days that, that we would be there. I don't know how many, there's no way I can know how many parking spaces. I know that there's going to be a lot of tours this summer. And, uh, and they have two or three in the back for staff. So you're mainly talking guests to the- Yes, absolutely. That they, they've mm -hmm. taken care of parking. Yeah, okay. I was just trying to get an idea of-, of Yeah, it's hard to say that's, okay. you know. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Happy to try to answer them. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Okay. So, just, you. do you know? So, when you have the tours uh, on a period of time, are the tours that people are? Yes, a uh, couple hours, and there'd be like one of those a day, or when you have them, or they go all through the day, or what's? There would be certain hours that would be listed. But you'd have a number on those days you have them, there'd be a number of tours or just. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more, one more question. Oh, Councilman. And I know you gave a lot of information and maybe I missed it. On average, how many people attend these tours? Did you mention that? Maybe you didn't, I missed it. Uh, I, uh, there again, I'm unaware of that. Okay. Uh, possibly. Cindy, do you have any idea? Just identify yourself again, please. Cindy Frank. Um, tour, we're, we have been closed since 19 from COVID. We've lost a lot of do docents. We're trying to open, hopefully, in April. Um, our schedule will probably be two to three days a week open for tours. We get um, an immense am amount of school tours that are buses and they drop their children off and then they come back. There is, um, because we have the Lewis and Clark and the Capitol and Adrian Island and all those things in the area where we park at for that area, um, you could have somebody come into the to the mansion and do a tour and then come across the street and do the historical site and then walk the grounds. In my experience in Jefferson City, the Capitol parking has been where they mark the tires and it's a two hour or a four hour limit what, or three hour or whatever. On this policy, I think that that would be more the way that we go with the parking situation. And I don't know how much it does for their parking meter people or the, the the police the parking police <laughs> but, but um if they if there could be some way to do that so that the state worker can't park there all day but that's kind of the the way that we're envisioning that that area of parking for the state and for the historical district in jefferson city to operate that might be a a, a different avenue well, they track it electronically. They're not allowed to touch the vehicles anymore. They do track it. But again, we were trying to solve problems, but we've got multiple problems. And this is one of the unintended consequences of trying to make things better. So we appreciate your feedback. Yeah, I'd like to add all these names that are on here. I've got three days to get these names. I can get them. Uh, but I decided last Wednesday to, uh, that I was going to do this. It was talked about, but nothing was being done. And so I decided I would take it on. I had unexpected company over the weekend. So I've had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday actually to get these names. Uh, and I know I could have gotten more had I had more time. But well, I wanted to be ready for this I, meeting. I don't know that it's necessary. You're more than one to do you know, what you think is correct. I mean, I think we've got the message. I mean, we take very seriously that we're the capital city, the mansion, mm -hmm. the historical society. I'm a member of the historical society, so okay. appreciate okay. what you do. Okay. It's very important to our community. Again, we're trying to wrestle with some legislation up at the Capitol, trying to address some parking issues that impact us as a capital city. And right. But we take very seriously 
the mansion, which is here 12 months a year. The legislature is here four and a half months. So we take very seriously the mansion and historical society and our local businesses. We're trying to balance it for everybody, and we appreciate the feedback. And we will take it serious as we try to reassess what we're doing in that entire area. Appreciate you including us in this. Council McKinnon. That's going to uh, no, and I, I think he makes all great points. And I was just going to reiterate, yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, yes, I mean, this is a concern. I mean, where I am employed, I am employed on the 200 block of Madison. So I'm very familiar with many of the people on this list. And um, so, yeah, I think we need to, you know, have more discussions and, and, and address this. So I appreciate you taking the leadership and the liberty to, to compile a list. So um, we have people that we can talk to as well um, outside of this. So thank you. Thanks for coming here. Anything else from staff? I think it's a work in progress. Uh, yeah, on the rate, uh, one other thing um, we had talked about and we had included in the budget and, and Britt had presented at the, the, I believe the council meeting and maybe I can't remember uh, that we talked about, you know, just looking at a 10% increase to that fund overall. So we have that proposal put together I just you know it's it's waiting to be acted on if you want to move that forward or you want to think about it some more uh, but uh, Brent presented a sheet I believe at the council meeting that that kind of showed you know where those rates would have to go so uh, uh, you know that's a council action to modify those rate tables and things so just want to keep that in mind and one thing I think we can do is look at uh, bring back to you guys on this issue uh, Kind of our utilization for this new area, uh, we can get that through you know looking at the 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 money that's been paid, and then sometimes we can also do a spot, just a quick count, uh, you know, through the area and say, okay, on Madison there seems to be about this utilization and capital, and you know we've had to modify uh, modify the original proposal already, so uh, we can bring that back next month, I believe. And I try to eyeball it when I walk yeah. by there. There tends to be more parking available there than as you get closer to the Capitol. Certainly. I know it's it's a challenge when there are events. I mean, I know they've been quiet. I mean, my office backs up, so I look at their facilities, and they've got that patio, and they, they used to host events on that patio. and they, But they tended to be after hours, but they did do some daytime. So makes sense to, to look at, at the whole thing. I appreciate, again, thanks for bringing it to us. Mayor. Identify you. yourself. I'm Carrie Durgeon, I'm mayor for a little bit longer, but I might mention since you are going to bring this up next month again, that if you or staff would want to, or direct staff, or if you'd want to reach out to the governor's mansion as well. I know Sherry Childs, like was mentioned, yeah, is listed on there. And I talked to her, she had seen me at a couple of events at the mansion over the last uh, few months when this has been implemented and just verbally asked about it. And I brought it up a couple of times at the last public works meeting mm -hmm. too, but I just think it'd be better since you're going to gather feedback and having them, you know, now that it's implemented and been in place to just see if that 10 hours makes sense. Like you said, now you're seeing the hang tags that are there when people can clearly be parking other places and a block and a half yes. a block away. Right. And we know that's, that's why we usually do not longer a, than that limit unless it's really needed for long-term parking. So maybe in that area, it's kind of an extension of Madison Street. And since the main users might be mansion and uh, historical society, maybe a lower number of hours might make sense too. So I don't know, but talk with them and see. I, I wouldn't know what their needs are, but now that it's been in place, they can give you some feedback. So thank you. Everything's on the table. Getting the, the document you were talking about the, has already gone to council, hasn't it? Or do we need to do something else with it here? Uh, it was discussed as a, as a part of the same presentation. We made a presentation at the closed session here uh, okay. at Public Works and at the council. Same same presentation, and it was presented in both. So, trying to. So are you asking to bring it back here for endorsement or just take it straight to council? Well, I think we need to discuss it some more, but I didn't want everybody to forget about it since we had that we tagged it here. It kind so of you, kind of flows you can in. Bring but it back yeah, I would I would uh, unless there's just some objection to it, we you know, 
looking at a one or to a five year plan at least, regardless of what happens with our parking garage situation, you know, with those rates haven't been modified really to any great extent holistically since 2005. So uh, you're just trying to keep up with our expenses and everything like that. So uh, I think we should, we, we would recommend that we look at at least that. And that's what we had to discussed in the budget as well. So at least a, the next few years increment, we don't have to do it all at once, but that would be more of a parking garage issue. But, um, but anyway, that's just didn't want everybody to forget about that. Okay. Well, just a real quick follow up question on the project, the Madison Street parking garage. Um, there's been some maintenance concerns, um, mainly housekeeping, cleaning issues. W what staff is responsible for making sure, you know, glass is not on stairwells and, you know, some safety concerns? Yeah, we uh, have a staff of seven in the parking division that handles not only the garage, but all the surface lots. I'm not aware of any litter issues uh, and would be uh, would very much appreciate knowing what those are because I'm not I've not been aware of any of that concern being raised. Just could you go over kind of what we have them do in the mornings? Yes, uh, we have, uh, you know, so we have a staff of seven. Uh, currently, we're down 1 officer. So the, the staff is divided by our. Our, our supervisor of the division, we have 3 in maintenance and 3, 3 enforcement officers. Currently, we only have 2 on staff 2 maintenance. Uh, uh, enforcement officers, uh, and they, they manage the garage from 6 in the morning till 6, 7 at night. So in 3, through 3 maintenance people, um, the, uh, 1st, uh, 2 folks come in 1st thing in the morning. I, I should also point out. That we are, I, I say we're down 1 staff member but we're also have 1 on military orders, So we're really down 2 staff members. Uh, so our normally we have 2 maintenance people come in in the morning to. Assess the, the maintenance that occurred in the overnight hours, not only in the garage, but on all the surface lots. Um, that person is who now we just have the 1 person doing that. Um, and then uh, we have, a uh, our booth attendant comes in at 10. And then they handle some custodial duties as they can all the way into the evening hours whenever they leave. Uh, the, the parking enforcement officers help out with that as well. But again, we're down 2 of them. So we, we are down 2 positions in a 7 person division right now. But if there are maintenance issues that that are not being addressed, I would very much like to know about that and we'll get it addressed 1 way or another. Do they walk all the stairwells and the garage every morning I, I would say they typically do when there's two of them but uh with only one may it may be falling to the wayside i'll find out though yeah we we typically have them walk through pick up like you know beer bottles if you want to say you know whatever whatever's out there pick cups everything uh, that's part of their duties and try to keep keep that litter picked up but uh yeah, if we're not, if we're not, uh, if there's an issue we're missing or something, we, you know, please let us know and we'll try to get that addressed. We'll figure out a way to make it. You know, regardless uh, of staffing, we'll figure out a way to make it right. I'm down there most evenings and weekends and there's a lot of activity with skateboarders and people in there. So no, they're broken bottles and things that happen. So you're going to bring that document back to this committee then? Peter? Yeah, I think Just next month, kind of getting back next month, uh, Unless you're telling me not to or something. No, uh, I, I think yeah, it, next it month, I think we need to look at it and, uh, and, and make, make some kind of decision on where the rates need to go at least in uh, for a year time frame, If not longer. So, we'll bring that up uh, particularly as an item. Right. Well, everybody's done talking parking. We'll go to another. Opportunity and talk transit. Mr. Stegman. Front of you, Jerry. Uh, the first item there is talk about our bus advertising contract. Uh, we go through Hawk Advertising. Uh, we went out for an RFP. They were the only ones that bid. Uh, they've been our current company for over the past 10 years. Um, they specialize in advertising for bus systems. And, uh, you know, we've got a guarantee of at least $20,000 a year out of them. Uh, last year, I think we was closer to 30,000. 
because it's uh, fifty percent of what they take in is what we get, but it's a guarantee of twenty thousand. So on this item, uh, you know, it, it takes council action. I can't remember if it would be a uh, uh, bill or I, it may just be a consent item, but uh, it's on the consent agenda. Yeah, I think yeah, it's on the consent agenda. So it's a multi-year contract. You probably already said that. I think yeah, um, three years so with. We do renewals each yeah. year, but uh, this is a new start of that. So we just thought we'd see if there's any issues that anyone knew of before we brought it to the council, but otherwise it'll be on the next council agenda. I think it's a great opportunity. And then Mr. Allers and I pushed for this years ago when we were on track traffic and transportation. I like the wrap buses and you know, they just look very nice going through our community. And, so and we do get, revenue. I would support it. So. All right. So. You just need kind of a sense of the committee today. Yeah, in the past, there's been some questions about the contract. So I just want to make sure you guys were comfortable moving it forward. Any comments? Make a motion. Opposition for it. No. Make a motion that we'll send to full council. Yeah. With uh, this committee's recommendation. So Second move. That. Second. Yeah. All right. Okay. All in favor, aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Item B. Next is uh, staffing and routes. Uh, we have. One new driver that is currently in training. We were so we still have uh, three driver openings, uh, full time driver openings. Um, we have one driver that's still out on medical leave, and we have another one that's currently out on medical leave due to an accident last week that someone hit our bus. So we have two drivers that currently can't drive. So we're actively trying to fill those positions. Managing right now with what we have uh, goes back to the topic of the routes, the uh, alternating routes. Uh, a lot of complaints. People are having a long time getting places. You know, it's really a big burden on a lot of people when you're trying to get from one end of town to the other. You know, normally you can get by in about 40 minutes, maybe an hour. Now it's taking you up to two hours to get across town. Uh, it's causing a lot of people. In the mornings and evenings with their work schedules. So we're trying to adjust to that as best as we can. I think you know. one thing that's happened, you know, I think you had some numbers, Jerry, we were talking about is, uh, you know, when we adjusted this, we knew, you know, it was, was going to be difficult, but you just physically can't get that many buses driven with that with that short of staff. But the uh, uh, one thing that has happened that we have noticed a pretty good uptick in a shift of riders from the fixed routes to the handy wheel system. You now we do have, we run those buses, uh, uh, full staffed. I think we typically have about 6 of those buses out. We have 2 spares. So occasionally, you know, if we have can find an extra person or. Find somebody we can pay overtime to, we can, we can sit another 1 out if it's not being repaired or maintained. Um. And so we're doing the best we can. However, that system now is uh, used much more frequently, so that that causes those rides to be longer. And what were the statute where you and I were talking about on that? We had there. Uh, if you compare our handy wheel service uh, from February to January, February, a couple days shorter, we had 200 more rides than what we had in January. If you complain February to February of last year. We were 1100 rides more than February of last year. So we are more than pre pandemic levels on our handy wheels. You know, our, our fixed routes with raising the rates and doing these alternating routes. Um, we went from 10,000 rides last year in February to 7,000 rides this year. Our transfer rate is up about 5%. Transfers are free. So, it, it, you know, People are having to do more transfers, having to do more weight. So, you know, with our handy wheels increasing, you know, it, it's really put a burden on the system. Uh, also, just the increase in applications. We used to get eight to 10 a month. We're getting eight to 10 a week right now on for handy wheels. wheels. For handy wheels. Anyway, just kind of a follow up report. Uh, the, the other thing that just there's some concerns mentioned about. Uh, the other night at council that uh, basically the buses still all go to the same places. It takes longer. There was like, well, why can't we extend the hours to maybe less than that? That just exacerbates our problem. 
uh, if we were, you know, you've got people trying to work a 12 hour day already extending any hours that that kind of puts the last straw on there and. And it's very difficult on people to work these kind of shifts anyway, but. Uh, uh, so, anyway, just trying to give you some some feedback and update on the routing and where we're at. 1 thing, once we can get some drivers, like I said, we were lucky to get a new driver. Of course, we're still there. Then we had another go out on uh, medical leave uh, through the accident. But uh, once we get hopefully a, another couple drivers, you know, we're still advertising. Uh, well, you know, our plan is to kind of get back into Missouri Boulevard would be our most uh, utilized route anyway at a normal time. So that would be our start. Once we get enough drivers, we feel we can open that up. We'll just go ahead and do it and uh, run that on the 40 minute headway, which also allows the Capitol Mall to run on the 40 minute headway. And so uh, that's that's our first uh, thing we would do once we can get some more drivers in place. So uh, just kind of report on that. Councilman Lester. So you said we didn't get enough drivers. How many drivers would you need to, to start? Well, I think that we need about out. two more back in in the mm -hmm. in the seat to do something like that to get started. And you know, the other thing is right now we are limiting vacation time off, which is very unfortunate for our employees. That's not a good thing to do, but we've had to do it for a long time. Vacation season will hit in the summer, just like everybody else. These folks have families and want to do things too, and need and just need and deserve time off to refresh themselves. So that exacerbates the issue a little bit in the summertime. So you know, we try to limit to only two people off at a time. Uh, you know, scheduled time off out of twenty some people that sometimes becomes difficult. Uh, and doesn't make for the best uh, uh, staffing. Uh, Friendliness there, yeah. but so I know I, we're doing what we can with that. Yeah, I know that the competition for staff I know is intense with the schools looking for drivers and other people. Uh, can we do something uh, to, to put us in a better position? Uh, the sign-on bonus or something? Uh, I'm not going to get out of this until we have more drivers. That's that's clear. And right now we're we have a, a service that's uh, really not not an adequate service uh, for many of the people needing it. Well, well anyway, that's well, I would, my question. I would say you know the uh, we appreciate the the council putting the the raise package through for and that affected our drivers and hopefully we'll see what comes of that with our next round of trying to hire folks and maybe maybe that has shaken a couple loose and hopefully helped retain some too. So I think you haven't letting that work a little bit. We'll see where we go from there. It's my suggestion. Councilman Spencer. Um, just kind of thinking outside the box here. <clears throat> Have we thought about looking at uh, the fire department, uh, having them possibly infill um, as some driver options? Um, they're CDL certified. Um, obviously they're used to driving big, big apparatus. So. Um, you know, their schedule might, might, might accommodate an option to, to infill something like that just for short term fill in. Um, uh, so just a thought. Yeah, that I guess I don't assume they don't have the passports. They'd have to get that, but it certainly we, we have, have an emergency part, provision to where we could exclude uh, that for a short term basis. Uh, I don't know that we can exclude that. Uh, we would have to get them certified in that. That's a federal requirement. Uh, okay. Um, uh, but again, we have part time positions available. So any any staff that wants to take on additional hours, uh, we'd be glad to talk with them. And we try to offer training to get people those licenses, updates and things like that. So if there are firemen who want to do that, uh, I think, you know, we'd be how long willing a training to work process with. would that be? It just depends on what they got. I mean, if you've got if they've got. Yeah. No, they will still have to go through the whole test in order to add the passenger endorsement. That's one of the requirements and stuff there. So um, it would take several weeks. You got a, a two week time from the time you get your permit for the passenger endorsement before you can take your test. And then uh, once we get there, uh, we do a mandatory minimum of 20 hours of just driving the bus out and about so they're familiar with the bus and how it handles 
and then we have a minimum of 20 hours of them driving with our trainers you know with passengers and stuff there so that's what our minimums are so it would be three to four weeks minimum before you can get someone to where you could let them go by themselves i mean any way we could fast track uh, having those training sessions maybe you know during a training session on duty i'm just like i said there's there might be some options to to accommodate that so thank you councilman so and going along with mr spencer's recommend or i guess just his suggestion um you know because i was going to ask too is like is there does staff have any kind of incentive for employees that if they are certified to to fill in a pinch to to receive maybe overtime because i know you know, I have friends on the, on the state level that they're primarily hired for one position, but then if, you know, you get hit with snow and say, hey, we need people to go out and plow snows, um, they'll jump in and help in a pinch to, 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 to get the snows covered and, and it could be overtime or, you know, maybe that week, you know, they adjust their, um, their normal duty to do that. I mean, I know that puts some stress out other places, but just looking for opportunities to move that direction so that, you know, anyone that is qualified and currently on city staff to have the opportunity to to fill in a pinch and maybe it's overtime maybe it's i mean it's just it's just, it's just things that i think we need to start putting on the table so. we would be open to that down there i mean we have no problem trading this yeah i think we're open to that in any department that is qualified i mean that could get qualified and get trained if they want to do over but if you're working a job at the city, you would be paid overtime to do it, which is, you know, just we're paying overtime anyway, quite frankly, to many drivers just because it's just the nature of the beast anyway. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we're certainly open to it. Uh, we haven't, no one's approached us about it. I guess, uh, can over at the other side of the room on that. If, um, I guess we could advertise that to our folks and see, see if any, we need any takers. Are, just a follow up question. I'm sorry. Um, can you have a hard shutdown as far as, far as like um, shutting down the service for for a week at a time or not? Or is it required federally that you have to continually? Uh, well, we do have the people we're paying full time and their benefits and everything. So if you shut them down and they're not working, you mean? Or? No, no. I would say like uh, have a hard shutdown for everyone within the division. To oh, go to on take vacation. a week off or something. Yes, exactly. Oh, I yeah, I don't know if that would be. Doesn't seem like that would be acceptable, but I. Well, the, I mean, it. obviously, you'd want to give the, uh, obviously, yeah, just, educate the public as soon as possible that that you know so they could adjust their. But I'm just yeah, again the, the pace guess. that these drivers are having, you know, fulfill on a day to day basis is only sustainable for a very short time, and so you know we got to give them some relief somehow um so just and, and this has helped I, I don't want to say what we're doing hasn't helped our staff because so what we've done is we we have shortened most of the overtime on the regular routes i would say or a lot of it yeah and but now we'll have a driver say well if you need an extra driver in the morning i can come in an hour early and drive a handy tool bus you know try to get people someplace we have people do that a lot so but it has increased our overtime on the handy wheel side but you know, the staff does, you know, they got to be available for those 12. And so sometimes they'd prefer to take an hour of overtime here or there. You know, they need a lunch break and a, some breaks, but, uh, but it's helped not having those three additional routes and the tripper routes. So you can't forget those. So cutting those out has helped us, you know, with our current staffing. It's just, you know, we, there's just no way to bring it back all at once until we get some drivers trained up. And then, and like Jerry says, I wouldn't overlook, you know, even people that can drive a bus. We had the, the new hire drove buses in the city of Columbia. So she's familiar with the type of bus, et cetera, but she's got to get familiar with the routes and where the stops are and all those kind of things uh, that, you know, it's, it, there's probably a little more to it than a lot of people think uh, figuring that out and, you know, if you have a patron with a uh, physical impairment, you know how to help them and, and get them situated before you take off again, things like that. So uh, there, there is some training that has to happen there. The, the gentleman that came to our council meeting Monday night, yeah. would, would he be eligible for the handy wheels? He is. He is a handy wheels client. Okay, he is one already. Okay. 
Councilman Kim. Well, no, no, I was just saying, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that we're aware of the pulse of other communities and how they're dealing with some of these shortages or, you know, if, if, um, if they, if they are, it's just, oh yeah, similar. And, uh, I think we're actually faring better than some because we're still serving all of our locations. Uh, just, uh, the, the wait is longer where some people have essentially went to job. Joplin, I believe we talked about is all on demand, meaning it's more of a handy wheel system, if you will. Uh, instead of a fixed route, there's plenty of others to Columbia cut back their hours and, and they're getting and, Columbia's getting ready to here the yeah. first part of April. They're going to go back to an alternating route like what we have now. So um, Joplin, they had we're a, not unique. Yeah, St. Louis is down. They're down almost 100 drivers. You know, so Kansas City's down. They're they're doing a lot better as getting drivers in, but uh, you know they've all upped their pay scales by large amounts. Springfield's short a bunch, but they've re just re renegotiated their union contract and it up their pay by several dollars an hour for starting out and different things there. So that's helping them out. Do we do we know of any other communities kind of like we talked about, man? This Incentivizing, you know, other staff members to maybe get trained. So if they do in a pinch, I mean, do we have other communities have programs like that? Um, are we aware of? Like what we, what we were talking about earlier, like if they're if, you're, if yeah. you're certified and we need a pinch, you're willing to help out. We we got these certain incentives. I don't know. I've not been any discussions with any of the transients that are pulling people from other departments. A lot of them are using their supervisory staff and, and things like that. The larger areas have got their supervisors out driving or manning stuff and, that they don't normally do. Yeah, I appreciate we that. do as well. Yeah. Yes. The, the thing about, uh, you know, bringing in people uh, from outside the group, they, they have to be consistent and uh, reliable in that way where, you know, a hit or miss doesn't add a route back, you know, uh, the, uh, we do that. We had to do that this year with snow plowing. So that's what we did with snow plowing. We brought in drivers from wastewater. We always had an overnight shift to wastewater, but this year we had to rely because we're down again there in both departments. We had to bring in a, a juggle in people during the day shift, which they normally be doing something at wastewater, but if we have a big snow, you know, and we had a lot of snow in the day this year, we had to bring in uh, crews from wastewater to help us there. Now they're getting paid, you know, to be here anyway, but uh, so it, it's a little more difficult, but because they're all under public works control, then, you know, they have to show up because <laughs> they all have, you know, funneled to the same supervisor essentially. Uh, but, um, and so we did the same parking. We had people downstairs helping clean uh, parking lots uh, in our survey and our uh, inspection division. So we've already done this in many cases for that effort. And so we're aware of that, but, uh, those those folks, uh, we got volunteers that wanted to do it. They got paid overtime, of course. They worked outside their normal hours, and uh, and, and it worked okay, you know. All right, let's move on to capital improvement sales tax work plans. Mr. Bangy leads us off. Thanks. So, uh, in your past, um, and I think I also have a slide here if uh, if they can bring up the slides. Yeah, it's the same presentation. I just, yeah. Um, and so basically every spring we bring a list of projects um, to this committee to talk about, you know, the things that we are intending to get done this year or, you know, work on in some fashion. Um, and so the, the, the sheet that you have before you in the memo kind of goes through that as well, but basically we've divided into several different categories, you know, kind of roadway. Uh, which basically encompass the large majority of the city county projects. And we're going to talk about those uh, more specifically a little bit later. Uh, but then stormwater sidewalks and then, uh, you know, some other projects that we're working on. So in terms of the, the major roadway projects, you know, we have several of them listed there and most of them, as I said, are city county projects. And so the MSP redevelopment project, basically we're looking at that as being the construction of Chestnut Street. And so we have a contract with BART, with uh, CMPS, and they'll be designing that this year. Uh, we'll be managing that contract and, you know, continue to working with the state, the state with the, the One Health Lab, 
and then also some of the, the private development that would be happening on our side to get that, you know, where it needs to be and, and continue to move that project forward. Uh, the transload facility, that's, uh, we don't have a lot of work to do there. The county is leading that one, but that is a, a city county project. And so work is already underway with that, with some tree clearing and some grading. And so that project will continue, but again, that's mostly handled by the county, but is part of that city county projects. Um, Could I just ask you sure. a question on the MSP? Mm -hmm. How detailed is the Chestnut Street discussions right now? And we raised the question in the meeting yesterday in regard to the state has expressed some interest in having parking on that street. And I know that the question is, are they willing to give up some state land to do that? But are we to the detail where that decision has been made or is that still under discussion? Well, certainly, I think from city staff standpoint, we're envisioning that road to be built without parking. Um, if that were to change, then that would be something that we'd probably need to know quite soon. Um, simply because that does change the entirety of the cross section right. at that point, you know, where the stormwater goes, you know, that kind of changes, you know, where all the utilities go, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that is kind of a vital component of what that what that project would be. And so um I, Yeah, and and just back on that, when we were talking to potential developers and users on our side, they they had a notion they would like to see that road pretty clear so they could access their facilities uh, more or less unimpeded. Uh, the and if you drive out there today, I was just, I just drove out and took a look after that came up at a meeting and you, you see quite a few people parked where they can right on the street. It's kind of like the downtown discussion and the parking lot is literally on the other side of the wall from them. And so it looks a little congested there. And if our you know, when our development would kick up on the city side, they're, you know, we're anticipating, you know, delivery trucks, uh, a lot of, a lot of people using, utilizing the facilities. So, uh, where the state is also planning a pretty good size, uh, parking facility on their, their side. So we were unaware of why that was uh, such a, a need on their end, but. Again, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, they could have a pull off. They could do a lot of things if it's for visitors, uh. Mm -hmm. But just trying to manage that well, if you think about large buildings in the downtown area, uh, you know, some we'd have to then start managing that probably as well, which again, pushing more parking people out to do other things uh, just becomes problematic from our standpoint. Well, the only thing I, I picked up was, you know, all those vehicles are going to come along Capitol or Lafayette where that is already the case. I think they're. The contention was it just gives it more of a neighborhood feel, especially if we have coffee shops or restaurants or things with inside the prison project. I don't know. It, it was just raised as as another issue, and I know we're going to have hopefully someday a garage on on our site. But mm -hmm. I mean, we compete with the Madison Street garage with street parking and garage mm -hmm. parking. That, that's why I raised, I assumed it was something that had to be discussed fairly quickly. Right, and I think Matt brings up a good point, you know, um, that if there were to be parking there, um, you know, trying to keep that parking open for the person who might be using the coffee shop, you know, I think that's a big issue because if it happens to be slightly simpler to park there for my walk into my my office complex, then I'll probably I know, we're getting do that. the same challenges yeah. we just discussed. Yeah, right, right. So I think, you know, you know, for that reason, and you know, we would like I think we would like the area to, you know, sort of be more cohesive from one side of the street to the other. And so, you know, if you have, you know, basically cars parked along the street, you sort of broken up that, you know, the cohesiveness between what we might have on our on the city side of the street with, you know, some sort of um, facilities, coffee shops, whatever, you know, in the office, the one lab on the other side, you know, it, I think if we, if we limit, uh, we keep the parking from the street, then that kind of creates a, a more universal, um, combined effort at that point, rather than that sort of the street becoming the dividing line. But again, that's just, uh, you know, just some thoughts on that, not necessarily, uh, um, I just raised the issue. It's come up recently. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that. Or we have it too far down the road, if that's going to be the case. 
Councilman okay. Spencer. Yeah, just just kind of piggyback off that, but for long term planning and potential mm -hmm. use changes, you know, 25, 50 years down the road, would it be better to go ahead and implement in design of infrastructure that the potential parking may exist? Well, perhaps, but I mean, the other thing is, you know, does the city want to take on the responsibility of maintaining what essentially then is a parking lot? You know, so we have, you know, a lot of streets to maintain. Uh, and in this instance, we would be essentially constructing a parking lot on the street that then we would be maintaining rather than, you know, the private entity, you know, who might be needing the parking, you know, it would be a public, it'd be a public benefit at a public cost. Um, you know, so I don't know if that's, you know, in terms of longevity and, and uh, you know, if that's a good idea for the city to take on that additional responsibility for future maintenance, just to provide private parking. And, and don't, and nothing, you know, we're just getting our contractor back up and going CMPS. Uh, we still got a lot of work to coordinate, well, obviously, with the state very closely on that building. Uh, like I said, there's, there's still a lot of options there. Uh, the, for example, federal courthouse, they specifically said no parking on the street, you know, security reasons. I'm shocked that the lab hasn't already told us that and they may yet. And the previous lab had concerns about security when it went in the, the 1 existing. And uh, what was going on next to them? I think they. They had a very small public space to pull into because it's really not a public facility to a high degree. And so we, we, we get mixed messages from them sometimes, uh, depending on what, who we're talking to. So, uh, our cross section is pretty full there with the pedestrian, you know, making sure we have good pedestrian movement there. But again, if they wanted to push towards their site, I, you know, we're, we can listen to that and see where we can go with that. So. There. Yeah. yeah. Um. So then, uh, kind of just continue down the list, the high street viaduct, you know, obviously we have a contract with Bartland West for that. And so that is underway. We've had, um, some preliminary meetings with them and the survey for that is complete and we'll be delivering that to them today. Um, and then we get down to the wildwood extension, which is a project that's sort of been introduced, um, to this committee and to us, you know, uh, since the sales tax sort of had been discussed. But certainly we'll talk about that a little bit more in the in the future. Right now, the plan is for that to kind of go back to CMPS for them to refresh and update the plans. Um, but then it looks like there's, you know, could be, you know, what would be the next steps for that? Um, there's uh, Monroe Street is also on the, and again, we're sort of, I've got some slides on that coming up. So we'll talk about that more in detail in a bit, but that's also part of what was included in the original sales tax. Militia Drive, again, kind of like Wildwood was something that the county has brought to our attention. Uh, so we, uh, we, as the city had volunteered to put together an alignment study for that. Um, and so there's some slides later uh, that talk about that in more detail. We're also looking to do some concrete street repair. Um, we've done some of that already. Um, and so we're looking to continue that contract um, so that we can uh, have um, um, Sam Gaines construction uh, continue to do some of that work for us and get some of our concrete streets uh, repaired. And then the last two things on the, that category street resurfacing, which is our typical overlay project uh, and then other uh, treatments and we'll be helping uh, operations you know, put together the contracts for those two things. Uh, and moving down to the stormwater category, we have a number of different projects that are um, about ready to go out the door. Um, we have a project on ISOM and, and another on major that are basically crossroad pipes to handle some flooding issues in backyards um, and then get the water off the street. One of them is the street is beginning to deteriorate because of the poor stormwater condition there. Bel Air is a big project. Um, it's kind of the second phase of a project that we had done uh, started about six years ago. And so that'll pick up some water at Orchard and carry it down to the creek there behind the school. So we'll look to get that uh, under construction this summer. And then there, the next three projects are all projects connected with what the water company is going to be doing. They're going to be putting some new um, water lines in those areas. And so we thought it appropriate if the street is going to be dug up to uh, include those projects uh, as well. So we can uh, gain some efficiencies there in terms of street repair, et cetera. And then again, we'll have some money to go towards a, a pipelining project. Um, and then also under that category, um, I think it was introduced at the council this past meeting. Um, so there's the possibility of the private stormwater conversion program, and there's already some money set aside if that program were to move forward. 
And so some efforts uh, in that regard to get that project up and running uh, or that program up and running. Um, sidewalks, we've uh, almost complete with the Adam Street sidewalk. Um, and so that's still underway, but we look to do some sidewalk on Beef Drive over by Water District number two. Um, and then we uh, are about ready to finish the, the JC Loop bike signing. Those signs, I think, are just about three quarters of the way up. And so next week or two, that should be finished. Um, we had two projects that are part of uh, TAP grants that we received. Uh, one of them is the 179 bypass trail, and then the other is the crosswalks at Southwest and Lafayette. So we're busy on design of those. Um, and then in May, there is another opportunity to apply for TAP grant funds. Um, and so the pool of available funding is actually uh, twice as large as it's ever been for that particular grant opportunity. And so we'll be looking to um, submit some additional uh, applications for that um, with the hopes of garnering some funds. And so uh, resubmitting a couple that we've done in the past, Boggs Creek, uh, then the Stadium and Satinwood project, um, and then perhaps others such as Lillian Drive or the Colonial Hill subdivision. Um, and then in the other category, um, right now we have, we're working with a consultant and Britt is mostly handling this um, for the design over at the airport for the new tower. But, uh, you know, we might be involved in some contracting with that as well. So now to kind of talk specifically, are any questions about that list as yeah, it just stands? Trying to do a rough calculation there, and there's a couple that kind of overlap. That looks like 3 million plus in sales tax H projects. I didn't actually add it all up, but that's probably about correct. My question relates to the street surfacing, mm -hmm. resurfacing, a million dollars. Mr. Smith made the comment in the meeting the other day that costs continue to increase, which means his comment was our three-year plan became a five-year plan, which concerns me a lot. We've made commitments to people in the community that we're going to do their roads. We did not do some of them last year. And I know we did do some concrete projects that we hadn't anticipated, so we made some individuals happy, but we've got to find some way to get additional money into that line item. I don't know if there's other monies available in, in sales tax age, but we've made some commitments that aren't even keeping up with the needs as you guys are all aware of, but we've got to figure out how to get more in that line item if costs are going to continue to go up. Yeah. Uh, so we've recently just got back a evaluation of all the streets. And so we're kind of summarizing that. So next meeting or two, we want to be talking about that kind of the need. So we will know the need a fresh up, look at the need. And then we can translate that into dollars and we have some estimates from our uh, asphalt uh, contractor here in town who usually always gets the contract always has. Uh, and so we can kind of show you at that rate. Here's what about what you get. Here's the need and, and then we can make some decisions from there or you, you guys can make some decisions from there. What uh, additional monies you'd want to maybe try to pull in, if any, and. Uh, but anyway, we're working. That's one of our major things to get going here in the next couple of months to really hone in on that uh, study and, and start talking about that with you guys. What's our time frame to be able to do that? Because I know, I mean, we were racing against the clock last year and trying to get on the asphalt schedule and, and so forth. I mean, when do we have to Typically pull the trigger to May, be able to do a project in 23? Typically by May, we try right. to bid. That's, that, that's, we're, we're on schedule to, to have something to ready to bid in the May time frame, which gives them the, the bulk of the summer to get the work complete. Councilman Spencer, I think, had a question or comment. Yeah, um, just going door to door, um, talking with folks, and, and it's been with overwhelming support of, of us looking at, and Ryan, you probably guide us on, on some of this as far as timing. Um, but I think with what you're proposing with giving us a good information on on street uh, conditions and those kinds of things is is extending the 5 year capital improvement sales tax from a 5 to a minimum of 10 to maybe even a 15 20 year window. What what would be a good scenario for us to try to implement that and also, you know, I, working with the county because the county, you know, we work hand in hand with a lot of county city cooperative projects. So uh, there might be 
might be some interest in, in them too. But we're just not gaining, as, as Chairman Fitzwater has stated, we're just not gaining any traction in it for any long-term funding solutions for, for maintenance. And, and that's what people are really advocating for out there on the street. So, yeah. Um, so an extension would require a vote of the, uh, vote of the, uh, the electorate uh, to approve um, just kind of paying armchair political analyst. I think the right way to do it is to do it not in cycle with the five year. Um, you don't want to put a situation where you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket and saying, pass this brand new extension that's many years past, but we've always done. I think the better way would be to do a, a, a an election campaign that is away from the regular five year cycle. So that way, if the re voters reject an extension, you're still going back in the regular five year cycle. That's probably the better way to do it. Um, timing, you know, once again, we have April, August, November of each year and whether or not that's a odd year, even year, um, you know, kind of conjoins with whether or not we participate in the election costs. You know, that's that whole thing, but, you know, it's, it's available for any of those elections. And so really the, the question is, is putting together an appropriate, you know, citizens campaign. And that's, that's something citizens have to take care of city can't take a lead on, on, um, you know, pro con for campaign issues. So there's a lot of flexibility, lots of options there. Uh, but I think the 1st suggestion would be don't do it when you're trying to do the 5 year, um, you know, it would be a off year. Type of campaign, and, and since we saw, since we've already passed sales tax it's, H, it's, now we've got we're, that. We're at up. H. It's it's in. Um, you know, we're not looking uh, for J. I Hi. thank you. <laughs> uh, um, until uh, you know a few years out, and so you know the suggestion would be is that you probably want to do that in the in the off cycle, so you're not it's not do or die. And I think working with our county partners, because I think that would be a, a, an unknown. Um, and if we could work it out to be both trying to get that done together, I think would really send a message to the community that we're we're really focusing and honing in on infrastructure. So. Yeah, no, it's it's. I, I think everyone recognizes it's really hard to do large long term projects when you're only looking at five years of funding at a time. So, you know, I I agree with uh, that sentiment that uh, we need to to have a longer period of time, and that would also give us more options uh, in for long-term uh, infrastructure, big infrastructure projects, because we'd be one option that we don't have now, apparently, because we are so, so short, short framed, uh, is it'd be open to the bond market. And if we need to access that, which could really benefit us, uh, I think uh, we've seen how Parks has used that to benefit uh, in their, uh, building the amphitheater, and uh, if they'd waited uh, uh, with inflation, uh, anyway, that turned out to be a very smart move uh, going to bond. Thank you, and thanks. I, mean, I, I just think it's a priority, and it impacts all five wards. I mean, we've got challenges everywhere, as you will. I mean, I'm not. I'm pointing out the obvious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you were. We got a little bit more here on the city yeah, county yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, just proceed on. Yeah, so um, just to talk a little bit about uh, the city county projects, ultimately with the addition of some of the projects to that list, um, we've got some charts coming up, but um, you know, the funding, the amount of funding that we have and the amount of funding that's needed to kind of complete all of those, you know, don't line up. And so, um, but I want to start by just talking about the Monroe Street project. And so we have a couple options here, um, and ultimately we'd like to sort of discuss which option um, we would like to see move forward. And so what we're showing here is sort of option number, or the first option, um, is essentially just purchasing the properties on the western side of Monroe Street. And then once those are purchased, there is no need for parking because there wouldn't be any, uh, no one to park there. The parking could be taken off the street and the street turned into a two way section. Very similar to what was happening just uh, to the south of that where capital region bought all the houses uh, along the street and uh, they actually turned those into parking lots. So that's an option. Um, a second option would be to sort of buy every 3rd house. 
on the western side of the street and basically create large driveways um, of out of the lots that you purchased. And so then there wouldn't be any need for parking on the street because the, you could provide for off-street parking. Again, no work done on the street, uh, but we've eliminated the need for parking. And so then the street could become two-way. A third option uh, would be kind of similar, except but instead of building driveways at every third house, we're now building small little parking lots. So we'd be purchasing two properties or three properties um, and building little parking lots. The number of parking spaces would about equate to what's on the street today. And so again, not touching the street, just providing some place for the parking to be and then turning the street two way by eliminating the parking. And so um, moving on to the next option, the next option would be actually what would need to happen to widen the street um, and so that would be what we're looking at is a 33 foot wide street, which is a our commercial section with parking on one side. So that what would that require is essentially the purchase complete purchase of probably two properties and the demolition of those houses and then the acquisition of about um, a strip off of another 12 or so properties uh, and basically widening the street to the east. Uh, and so that again is is probably more expensive than the previous ones uh, the dollar amounts for all those are down in the lower right hand corner of all those slides um, and then kind of in addition to those uh, those options would be to address the issues that we have between the, uh, the expressway and Dunklin Street and the traffic signal at Dunklin and so right now we have a rock cut uh, as you're all aware, it's kind of sloughing off. The sidewalks are partially closed on the section between the highway uh, and Dunklin. And so this part of the project would address those issues. And so uh, it's separate, but but on the same street. And so those are kind of, you know, options. So this this option would sort of be either not or in addition to the others, but certainly looking at, you know, what direction we would like to go regarding the piece um, uh, you know, where the, where we have the one way section now, which is between Franklin and, and, uh, I've forgotten the name of the other street, Hickory street. So, um, if the committee would like to give us some direction as to which one of those options they prefer, we could certainly move forward with that, uh, in that direction. Um, are the numbers that you're showing, is that total project costs or just the city's portion? That would be the total cost for that so particular that option for the city correct since the county has at least expressed interest in this being a joint project correct right mm -hmm. yeah, and i think so what we're trying to get across is that you know there's a lot of options here and various uh various folks we've talked to have a lot of different expectations they're all ex fairly expensive so we tried to uh this is a project that we will try to do in-house as a design uh uh, in-house design on uh, something we we would excel at I think our staff but um, so there's a lot of options there it doesn't obviously have to be decided today but we just want to give you a flavor of the discussion of that project because I think in the, the kind of the last slide we kind of try to line all these options up and say okay this this project has a range of the most expensive thing on here the full deal is this most minimum is this and then that's I think that's where our right. main discussion is. So you don't have to decide anything today, but you know it, it has to work with all the other things we want to do in this current sales tax. So, mm -hmm. so, so I would just say uh, uh, that first option, uh, uh, certainly considering uh, that we already have a real need for housing, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the an option that we'd want to do. Mm -hmm. um, that and it being the expense of it, um, of the those three, uh, or that that uh, fourth option uh, seems to be most consistent with what uh, the Old Mirror South Side plan uh, was envisioning. Uh, so I would, you know, I, but again, that's one of the most expensive options, but uh, that's most consistent with the plan. Um, I don't, I don't think, uh, having, uh, 
guess it's the third option there with the big parking lots. I don't I don't think that would be an option that would be people would want. Uh, anyway, that's mm -hmm. some of my comments on it. Um, dealing with the, that other part of, of it, uh, certainly we need to at some point deal with that up, up from uh, with the expressway uh, to Dunklin. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I, that, that's just something we need to deal with at some time. Uh, just like. mm -hmm. um, so certainly keep that in mind and then we can kind of move on to the next, the next uh, thing. So this well, is just, oh. I, I was, I was going to support. I think that from the expressway up through Dunklin, I, mean, I think that's critical for our community. I mean, that that is an eyesore for people coming into our community. And I realize some of the changes becomes more of an eyesore if we make some of the changes on Monroe, less of an eyesore since people are going to be entering that. But that piece to me seems critical. How we attack Monroe, I just want to make sure we do it right. I agree with you. I mean, money was no op option. Yeah. Doing it right all the way through. I do agree with you. The housing, you know, if we can eliminate having to buy and destroy houses, that's. I don't know if we do a combination with the one with the parking lot short term to kind of fix Monroe and still have the money to do the entryway there from the expressway up through Dunklin gives us some leverage but to me that we've made commitments to fix this area in, in some format doing that where the wall come down is just a horrible look coming into mm -hmm. our city so that piece to me seems critical but I mean I, I agree with the councilman on eliminating housing at, at this time seems like a drastic choice I know the people that come in here were very cordial in the fact that they might lose their homes and I mean, it was a very difficult conversation but they were very community focused but if we can eliminate that and still meet our commitment to to cap region and and some of the other businesses the old munich burg and clean up you know maybe that's a good middle ground to at least get us started and uh I so i guess i'm i'm saying maybe i guess it's option Six hundred seventy-five thousand with the big parking lot, which mm -hmm. three, which doesn't eliminate many. I guess there's a little bit of property we have to buy to build the parking lot, but with the long-term plan, that hopefully we can do it right all the way through there. Yeah, and th this is the what we did something similar on the other end of Monroe Street over by Stadium. We had to eliminate some on-street parking there at the Signal, south of the Signal at Stadium. And, uh, and we created a parking lot because of those houses along there used the street for parking. So we had to take that parking away. And so that's that's kind of where we building off that idea over there that worked, uh, came up with this notion. And uh, downside is we maintain some parking lots, um, but it does help us get our, you know, the goal of getting the two way traffic. There's what's the traffic count here? I forget. It's not a very high count. Obviously, it's one way. Uh, mm -hmm. For some of it, I, I don't know, Matt. Anyway, uh, it's a lot, quite a bit of money uh, to turn it two way, when, and the current traffic count is pretty low compared to some of these other things we're talking about. So just keeping that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. So it seems those two options puts us in the range of 1.4 million. So half half of that seems like a good, reasonable target as a commitment I mean, again i'm one of ten so there's other voices but this i think needs to be a priority project we committed to making some changes here but so mm -hmm. i i was just going to say that i expect the traffic uh once uh the uh the parks, the the facilities at the school get completed, the traffic in this whole area will probably increase, uh, including Monroe. Mm -hmm. 
That's all right. Um, so, so on 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 the parking lot option here, I would highly recommend that we get some pretty close study and feedback from our public safety uh, divisions on something like this. Um, having public kind of public parking uh, tucked into uh, into residential neighborhoods like that, I just for me raises some public safety concerns, and so I would would definitely want uh, you know the chief and his staff to take a look at this and have provide opportunity for feedback as well. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Good to go. Okay. How can I ignore you? I, I don't know. I was raising my hand. I need to speak. I'm up. sorry. That's okay. Um, I'd also like to to know that the, the two way Monroe conversation really drive was driven by a neighborhood conversation. Um, during the, the South side old Munichburg neighborhood plan development, it was talking about the neighborhood as a, as a package. Um, and 1 of the comments that came out of that conversation was the 2 way Monroe street would help the neighborhood. Um, so, when, when considering the decisions. For the neighborhood, um, really like to encourage 1 that the, the housing is there. That's that's a big deal, um, but also. This is one of our strategically monitored neighborhoods identified in our comprehensive plan. Um, so changes that you make, like the parking lot, um, anything that's not within the neighborhood plan um, or within the comp plan could could cause problems that we have to clean up later um, with the rest of the neighborhood because we look we're going to look at Monroe and then at some point we got to look at Jackson. Um, so there's there's a process to where it fits within almost a stack of dominoes. Um, so when when you're thinking about this project, um, I would encourage to think about the neighborhood as a whole uh, versus just the the public the public improvement part of of making it two way. And I would just say I I I do not care for the big parking lot uh, uh, proposal, and I don't think the neighborhood will would either. Uh, I I also uh, know there's some uh, persons in the audience that may want. I think to there's a neighbor that may want to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I have a, yeah, I have a, a couple comments. Please, um, please um, identify yourself. Oh, excuse oh, me, my name is Willard, 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 um, during that proposal, during that proposal the, the option, option to expand Monroe Street, Monroe Street to the east side, the east side was, presented was presented as, as favorable, most favorable, which at that which time, at that time we were in three or three, 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 three houses, one of which one was, of ours, which was on ours on the corner of Monroe. Um, um, during that during time, during that time, we had already we been, had already searching, been the market, searching the market to relocate, to relocate in, Jeff in Jeff City. Well, once well, the city, once came, the city out, came out, the idea the of idea our, our, our home, our home it kind of put a hold on our plans because, 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 because we would have we to, would have to disclose, disclose that we that the city wants to demolish it. Demolish it. So all so we asked of the, ask the city is to, is to come up with some up resolution, some resolution to this, to this, whether you're going to widen it, widen it on our side, take our house, take our house or, 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 or leave, us alone. leave us alone. Um, um just like we just like an answer someday, someday, someday and, and hopefully, and hopefully soon, soon. Um, um, thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your, uh, time. Thank you. I know you were very generous in the comments you made it last February. So thanks for your input. It looking at option two, is their home one of the ones that would be in the under consideration? Uh in the plan where we were in widening the streets, so it would be option four as it was shown, um, that would impact their their property. Um the other options would not. So, so it just option two would not correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think 
Mr. Waters. My name is Steve Waters. I own the property at the corner of Hickory and Monroe. Uh, it's 906 Monroe Street. We were also here last February and listened to the proposal, which I thought was the best proposal, but it turns out to be also the most expensive proposal. Correct. Uh, but it did the least, I think it did the least amount of damage affecting that neighborhood and giving us what we wanted because there are, other than the two houses they were talking about on the corners of Woodlawn and Hickory, that's all empty along there. First option that you're showing today, I was a resident and also a landowner in that area. Uh, I think taking out all those houses is really not a good idea uh, because of our housing shortage that we have here in town is one, but uh, it does nothing for the neighborhood uh, in that area. So definitely, I don't think that should even be on the table uh, for the good of the city. The second proposal with the parking lots, I'm really opposed to that. I think you're just creating a lot of problems with public parking along that street. If just living in that neighborhood and seeing how those people will have to navigate from the parking lot to their homes, I don't think it's a good idea. So I want to go back to first proposal that we listened to in February. And I think that would be the best proposal. Yes. Correct. We had the public hearing. And it, is that, that that's number four? Is right. It's 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 essentially that's what's shown on the screen now. So I guess I'm here as public to endorse, even though that's the most expensive, I believe that's really the best option for that neighborhood. The that section plus the Dunklin down, so it'd be about a three and a half million dollar project. Correct. Yeah, and going back to the one from the highway to Dunklin Street, I think that should be your priority right now, especially if we can't do the others. Is that is it's, out by there a couple good. of times, and if any of you have been through Adams Street and see what they've done over there, oh my gosh, just the work they've done there is amazing. That has really improved that whole area. It's 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 really nice. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to bring up was the gentleman that just spoke before me being in limbo for that area and not knowing is really hard. Uh, the house that I own, I plan on putting on the market in about May or June, but if they think it's going to be taken away, it's going to be darn hard to sell a house to somebody that, well, in three years, they're going to tear your house down. Uh, that's not good business. And I probably wouldn't even be able to sell it knowing. That was an option. So anyway, I'll be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, but uh, that's just my comment at this time. I'd be, I'd be curious uh, to know your opinion about option, the option two. Uh, and, uh, not, um, or, yeah. That's the parking lots. Uh, driveways. Oh, that's the driveways. The driveways. Uh, that would I wouldn't be opposed to that. I think you could probably improve the neighborhood having the extra driveway along each of those houses. Uh, I know the one from Hickory, uh, there's a vacant lot between the church and our property. I have a carport alongside, so we do have off-street parking at the, at the place I own. The house next to us has off-street parking. It also has a carport in the side of it. So if you do the properties on up the street, like it looks like about every third one, having off street parking along the side of those, uh, just for that particular resident, that might work, I don't know. How. Yeah, but that, that does look like you're saying you have to buy, purchase, take those properties out. Yeah, correct. So the one lot is vacant, the green one, uh, or the one that has the green undertone. The uh, the other three sort of bluish ones, those are existing houses that would be taken down and converted into driveways. But again, you're driving up that street and just, and I'm there every day seeing, I think every one of those houses are occupied. I don't think there's a vacant house on that street right now. Uh, so again, we're doing away with housing when we start tearing down housing and trying to improve it. My ultimate goal is on the one, our property on Hickory goes from all the way from Monroe Street to Poplar Street. 
the lot goes the entire distance. My initial intent was to split that lot like the rest of them that run down through there and actually put another house on the backside, a small for low income housing or however you want to, you know, affordable housing. I don't want to say low income because it would be a very nice brand new house. And at this point, I am not able to split that lot because of the dimensions of the lot. They said there wasn't enough square footage, which you can see about half of the lots through there are already split. So I will be pursuing splitting that lot if we can decide on how we're going to do Monroe Street so that I can actually put another property or another house in the back. And it will not be a rental property. It will be a property for sale for somebody. So I just want to express my appreciation to you for, for the house you're working on. It's it's a really nice house. I don't know if you go by there uh, and look forward to it being on the market soon and hopefully this won't negatively impact that well and that was my goal actually when i bought purchased the property that i have it was actually pretty well gone the, it was internally it was gutted there was a fire in it we wanted to maintain it keep it and so i've gone in and put a lot more sweat in it than what i anticipated <laughs> but it's going to be nice and it's going to be nice for the neighborhood i love the neighborhood uh you know not living there, but being there every day. It's I enjoy being over there. So. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you coming. And I would say all these discussions, I always tell people because sometimes people get excited about seeing these things and they're basically it's just lines on paper at this point until a decision is made. So we can we can draw all kinds of lines on paper, but it uh in fact uh, many times what we find is uh, we start doing these master plans in the past uh people will actually target to buy those houses because they want to sell them to the city later. Uh, and so we get some of that as well. But, you know, as part of planning, we just got to give everybody all the options so they can make good decisions. So, so we you know, mm -hmm. don't mean to upset the neighborhood area, but you guys need the information to make good decisions. And I, and I think that's a good point just to reference one of the comments, or I guess the two comments it has been since last February, but there's been a lot of work behind the scenes that's been going on to get us to this point. So, I mean, I, mean, I appreciate, but we're obviously going to have to push this project forward so people can make decisions on their lives. And I know you guys have been working on things, so mm -hmm. thanks. Mm -hmm. You want to proceed, Mr. Bang? Sure. So... Um, another thing that we've been working on, and this had kind of come up in discussion with the county over the last several months, and that would be that was uh, the extension of Militia Drive um, as a possible project uh, for the city and county to work on. And so uh, the last time we indicated that the city would be willing to sort of do an alignment study to look at the possibilities for expanding that road. And so what you see before you is uh, our five different options that we have come up with for the possibility of that road. Um, and so what you see at the top of the screen is the interchange itself. And then uh, you can kind of see a, a, a black line coming across the middle of the screen. So that's the city limit line. So north of that line is uh, Jefferson City. Uh, and then there's another line that continues down the middle of the screen. And so to the right hand side, this is the city of, of uh, Taos. And then this is unincorporated Cole County over here. And so basically the five options are looking at, you know, what, what, what would it take to get uh, between those two locations and what would you have once you made it to Liberty Road, which is the road that goes across the bottom of the page. And so kind of looking, this is a blown out picture, just kind of getting a feel for the topography. And so you can see at the top of the interchange is right here at the top. And then you can kind of see each one of those five options in different colors across the top. So the first option, obviously, as you come along, you've, you've basically at the top of the hill, there's a nice ridge that runs over and ultimately ties into what would be Shamrock Road over here. So in some ways that could potentially be a, a nice future alignment. There are some residential properties here, however, that would kind of prevent you from getting there without the purchase and uh, of some privately owned properties. The uh, in that line, ultimately, as you can see, and I can go into greater detail, but it's basically in the city um, and in Cole County. The red line, it, uh, probably a little difficult. It's uh, as you come over, you can kind of see kind of this dark patch right here, very, very steep. And so if you were looking at a future extension of that alignment, then perhaps that's not the best choice. 
the green line, somewhat akin to the green, the red line, except it's a little bit better. You can actually slip off and down into what is Rising Creek, uh, which is this the, the the sort of the whitish area that you see. Ultimately, might be a good place for that road to extend, which sort of is a benefit for both then the red and the the sort of light blue line. Also, when we're looking at development, we're also looking at sewers. So certainly, if you're looking to sewer this area, um, you know, going along the creek probably makes uh, makes some sense. So again, this is just another map, and this is showing the floodway and the floodplain that are in the area. And so there's some some floodway right here on Rising Creek, but then certainly as you look, the sort of the grade area is all floodplain area. So again, when you're looking at an alignment, looking at development off of those potential alignments, you know what what hurdles might you face? And so that's certainly one that we take a look at. So then I'm just going to go really quickly through some of these alignments. This is the first one, which would have been the leftmost one. Um, again, there's some quantities there, cut fill quantities, uh, you know, 87,000 cubic yards of cut that, or fill that we would need for this project. Ultimately, there's the county has indicated that there's the possibility of, of coming to this knob, which is owned by the Vanderfelts, in order to acquire that um, amount of fill that we would need. But certainly, that's a lot of rock to move. Uh, option two, which was the the middle, the one of the two middle lines on the previous slide. Ultimately, this would require the largest amount of fill, uh, and it would also be the steepest grade. But it's also the shortest. Um, so again, each one of these has some pluses and minuses. This is the third alignment. Again, this is probably a little bit better in that the Liberty Road is actually at a lower elevation, so you don't have to climb as far, and you can actually get this sort of bluish, the bluish area. Um, is a cut area of the road itself, and so you'd be moving material uh, not quite as far uh, in that scenario. Uh, this is option. What was the fourth? The the fourth option. Um, again, this is probably a pretty reasonable option. It actually basically balances the cut and fill that you need within the project itself, um, and so could you know perhaps be a, a viable option. Uh, the downfall of this and this and the previous one, obviously, is that they go from the city straight into Taos and don't actually touch the county at all, the unincorporated county. And so, again, what would the county, how would the county react to those particular alignments? And then this is the fifth option, which is the flattest of the routes uh, and would provide some access to some of the flatter areas uh, that could be developable. But again, those areas are also in the floodplain. So that's you know, basically the five alignments that we've come up with. I think the county is, I've provided these slides to the county and they are talking about them, I think at a meeting concurrently with this one. And so ultimately, um, you know, we've, I think done what we intended to do in terms of looking at how each one of those potential alignments affects the property next to them and what sorts of development might be able to happen uh, along those. So then that kind of brings us to kind of a larger discussion, and this kind of goes back to Monroe Street and back to some other things that we were talking about, uh, and probably a, a, a important point to uh, get some clarity on for us in terms of direction. So if we look at this chart, ultimately we have kind of listed on the left-hand side the various projects that we're discussing. The top four of them were within the what were, were described as the sales tax H language, uh, High Street Viaduct, Stadium, Monroe, and Economic Development. And you can see the associated costs, uh, which is one of those were the allotted costs that were part of that sales tax, 5 million, 3 million, 1 million, and 2 million, respectively. But then in the next column, you can see what the sort of the range of costs that are associated with those projects. And so the High Street Viaduct, um, you know, we have a range, we had 5 million identified within the within the sales tax, but we're believing that project is going to cost us 12 million to build. Um, Stadium Boulevard, we presented a project last time as part of that TAP application that was a $2.5 million project. Um, Monroe Street, again, we just talked about that. So the price ranges on that from the cheapest, which was 675, and that ranged up, as Ron had indicated, up to 3.5 million. Economic development category, right now we have $800,000 of that that's pledged towards the, the transload facility, but we also understand that that project is underfunded and that they're looking for grant funds, but ultimately, if those weren't to come through, then perhaps there's another $2 million worth of, of funding that would have to come from somewhere, so we've stuck it there, whether that's completely accurate or not. 
Wildwood Drive, um, the county had come and presented that project. Obviously, there wasn't any money associated with that, with the sales tax um, language. But ultimately, we're looking at about $3 million for that project. Um, and then Militia Drive, which we just spoke about, again, uh, was kind of a new project, which looks like it could have a range of costs up to about a million and, or two and a half million. So basically, we have 11 million available to us, and the project ranges uh, that we were looking at uh, projected, you know, are somewhere between almost 12 to almost 26 million. So uh, we then kind of looked at what could be some potential ways or schemes of looking at these projects uh, and how could we fund them uh, and, and sort of match up with the $11 million that we have available to us. And so these are just examples, uh, scenario, possible scenarios of, of that funding. Um, and so kind of under example A, we're basically fund, providing funding for the high street viaduct just slightly less than what we'd have, you know, originally accounted for at five million. Uh, so this would be at four and a half. Funding the stadium project um, and then the economic development project for the transload facility and putting $3 million into the Wildwood project. And so that would bring us to our total of 11. In the second example, we'd basically reduce all the money that we have set aside for high street except but for the money that we're already spending for the design the conceptual design you know keeping the stadium project doing the full 3.5 million for monroe um, providing some additional money if necessary for the transload facility and doing wildwood um, and again all these militia drive we're not um, putting any money into at all example c bank some money for high street um, the 10.2 the probably isn't enough to get that project done, but if we save that and we're able to find some other funds or into the next sales tax cycle, we could certainly get High Street built and just work on the other transload facility as the other project within that category and everything else would have to, you know, have to be delayed. Uh, and then example D, um, save some money back for High Street and, and then work on Monroe um, and Wildwood and still fund the, uh, the transload facility at the 800,000 that we have. And so that's, again, those are just examples, just possible scenarios, but ultimately, you know, we have more projects than we have funding for. And so as a staff, we really need to understand what the, the council, the committee and the council would like us to work on. And so if, if there could be some direction in that regard, it would really be helpful for us. Just one question: the the two hundred thousand is that coming out of sales tax H then, or out of the million dollars we moved over for the viaduct project? Um, out that BARPA funds, right? So, I think we actually have that tagged to the uh, to the ARPA money that was put into that project. So, but it essentially frees up right. two hundred thousand. Correct, it's not a lot, but right, it sure, is a lot. Councilman Spencer. <clears throat> Does any of these uh, funding options take into account of what we still have left of sales tax? And I hate to say the word gleaning G funds. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, what we have, and there's a note down at the bottom, okay. um, we do have um, about 300 or $3 million of sales tax G funds, um, part of the city county projects funding from last sales tax. And so that money is there. Um, waiting for us to move forward on MSP. But not gleaning. But that, it's not gleanings. Not, that um, was dedicated for the MSP project. Correct. But being at the pace that the MSP project is currently going, um, that might be some opportunity to tap into that and then replenish that those dollars once we get closer. Um, right. And, and But to answer your question about the gleanings, I, I, I don't know exactly what that number is. Okay. But uh, I think that's around 1.2, I think, somewhere in there. So I guess what I was wondering, um, I mean, you know, we obviously have a priority of, of essentials here and uh, being with the high street viaduct is pretty important. But if we took um, uh, sample A, example A, and took Wildwood and split that in half with militia, because what I'm really trying to accomplish with the Wildwood extension is not necessarily getting that necessarily completed from the start, but just being able to open up access to property that 
developers that come to me and saying, you know, we need to get this first kind of order section done so we have access to that property for mm -hmm. future development. Mm -hmm. um, and then trying to accommodate, you know, some development and growth on the east end. I think if we could kind of do that in dual tracks with Wildwood and Militia, I think that would be a great a great opportunity, but we still have the $1.2 million of sales tax G funds that I think we need to commit hard to infrastructure projects. And so if that's, you know, adding more to the militia uh, and Wildwood or, or the wild or the Monroe street. Um, or, and don't forget the overlay part of it. Or, and definitely the overlay part of it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I think what David, you know, we talked about, I'm sorry to interject, but so we talked about this a lot. And so we're, you know, for us to move forward and get something accomplished, if we just had a focus a little bit on one and and how we do this, you know, fairly small staff, the the Wildwood thing has changed a little bit here recently. That pro, uh, there's some uh, a group of people that own I, I think I say his name, uh, Lale property that has sold to another person now, and that that person's contacted me and others. I'm sure they might have contacted you, uh, and so they are. It's my understanding they're putting together kind of a sketch plot of development of that property and also looking at the chamber piece, which is closer to Edgewood. What David has on the sheet is not the full amount to get it all the way. That's what came off Eric Landwehr's slide, and we've talked to him about this. To get it all the way, the county was going to kick in additional money above this to get it all the way out to Rock Ridge. And so that would be a big – now that, that design is more or less put together. they got to refresh it. So that can move fairly quickly. I don't know the developer's track. We've never actually never talked to the guy directly. I've talked to his relatives and various things like that. But uh, anyway, so I, and he's lives in Florida right now, but he's interested in this property. Well, and, and, and that's the that's the property that I'm referencing yeah. as well. And, yeah. and I would volunteer to go to Florida and have those one on one discussions. Well, he lives in Naples, I think. So that's a nice area. So. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, and so you can kind of see our dilemma, you know, if we too too much shotgun approach, we won't accomplish anything. So having some focus and a lot of times if uh, if Wildwood's ready first, if we build Wildwood and we kind of know our expense there and, you know, think that's going to change. That's an estimate. And we this is how we've done in the past. We get we you know, we go all in on the project. We just got to do it till we're done. And uh, whatever the cost is, it, it ends up being it is. But. Uh, you know, so it's going to be around 3 million, but then having the second one lined up, we're ready to drop uh, the next one. And so that, that could easily be stadium. It could easily be Monroe. It could, it, it could be none of those. It could be, it won't be high street because we don't have that money unless we want to borrow it or bring it in from somewhere else. Uh, so those are the things. And then also that having that focus allows us to apply for grants. So we know the stadium one has good grant potential for sure, just because of, what's going on there. Um, but, but with not the inclusion of the sales tax G gleaning funds that hopefully that's a little bit more of an optimistic. Yeah. Know, I mean, and so that's a council decision if they want so. to put more money in, but still having a focus on what we're actually going to do on these projects. And like I said, we gave you a range on the, the Monroe street. There's many other projects we could do on stadium, but that's the big one we had talked about with the grant. Uh, but that just some, something that we need to consider. It's a lot of information. You don't know. You don't have to make a decision today, but we'd like to be talking about it and and kind of honing in. You know, once you can sleep on it a little bit and figure out what we where we want to go with this, so we can get our staff. If we're going to design a full blown Monroe Street, that's going to take us a little bit of time. Or if we're just going to design the intersection, that takes us less time. So, uh, same with Stadium. If we're going to proceed with that one and get that and we think there's a really good potential to get the next round of grant on that we need to get designing on that if, but if nobody's interested in that that's okay we just need to know that so we can focus on other things so well to me just taking a, a first look at it example b seems to be the one that matches I me mean, we put a million into the viaduct it seemed like at that time it was about a two-year process just to get the design phase done. We're year into sales tax H. So you know, shooting that forward, then we're kind of on the backside of H if they were to come back and say, hey, this thing needs attention immediately. Mm -hmm. Stadium Boulevard, I, I mean that that goes through multiple wards. 
I think all three high schools in the city feed onto that. So to me, that seems like a, a critical project that we have Blood some control as well. Yeah, and yeah, we've had a lot of issues there. I can't support anything that has a zero from Monroe Street. Now, whether we have to take it all the way to 3.5, I mean, I think we're going to have to negotiate with the neighborhood and figure out how extensive, but zero to me is not an answer that, that I can support. The, the 1.8, I mean, we're committed to that project, but we've already got outside other individuals coming to, I mean, that's going to be a massive project for that side of town. And you know, I think we've made the commitment, again, one of 10, I've made the commitment to that project because I think it makes sense long-term for the community. How we divide the Wildwood, my impression was when Mr. Landwehr was here that he felt comfortable kind of doing both projects, but putting Wildwood on the front side and you know, we're not any, we're not as near on the militia, but keeping it on the radar screens. So mm -hmm. if we have to divide that money up a little bit, but my impression would be the bigger portion would be pushed toward Wildwood and H and we'd pick up the militia side and, and I, I mean, again, we've got a little bit of money left over from G to maybe help on some of these projects. So I'm trying to look at the four options. B would be the one that would be closest to where I think our priorities are. And again, it would just be a discussion of how deep do we want to go in Monroe Street? And I've made the comment that if we're going to do it, we need to do it right. You know, whether that means all of 3.5 million, but zero is not an option to me. I mean, we've made a commitment there. Got two others that have not made comments. So Councilman Kendall. Yeah, no, and I don't have anything more in addition. I I, I know he said option or example B, and I think that, that I, I could I could be with that. I mean, the Wildwood Militia. I mean, obviously Militia is east end, but you know when you look at the the, the work that's going on in Algoa, um, I think there's talk of a truck plaza going into play. I um, and that should be coming to us soon. So I mean, there's growth going there. So so what I would want to see happen is there was five proposals, you know, and I think a long time ago, we talked about extending militia drive all the way to 179. And I know that's a, that's a costly, costly endeavor, but I think with those, I think we need to at least get like, okay, what direction are we going to, to go with this? Because some of those proposals, if you go that route, well, then you kind of maybe kill maybe that idea of future growth um, of connecting it to 179. So I think, Having the county weigh in on it, looking at those, seeing like, okay, I think this is the direction we want to go. You know, even if we go to a section where, all right, we're going to have some terrain issues, but at least we can say this is the way we want to go with it, and then, you know, make those decisions down the road. Just like, I mean, you were saying with with Wildwood, like, you know, at least getting access to some of this land so that people have access to start developing on both ends of town. I mean, and that that would be my steps in weighing in on this. Um, I mean, we've got, we've got time, um, or the, and the council has time to, to, to weigh on this, uh, future. I think county is going to weigh on, on what you've sent them. And, um, so, but as far as, Hey, if we want direction now, I mean, I think everybody's on board with the high street viaduct. I mean, I think that's not a question. Everybody wants to go that direction. Um, others, you know, I'd like to see Monroe as well. Um, what can we afford, you know, is a question. So, but I, example B is, I think is, is a good one. I mean, we can still have some healthy conversations with the Wildwood and Militia on how we can handle that. So. Oh, and I do have another question. Sure. Uh, I did just, as far as some of those routes, you said some of them are going to go through Taos, mm -hmm. poten potentially, if we go that direction, correct? Correct. And so Correct. with them going through Taos and let's say those residents want to connect to sewer, mm -hmm. you know, what, I mean, I mean, I got kind of gets sticky. You know, what, what is, I mean, what, what, where do we go with that? I mean, because we can't annex them. Yeah. They've already got their own sewer system. So I, I don't think there's any potential for growth there for us. The, and a sewer part of that. And so we have talked to Eric, obviously, Landware about this quite a bit, and I think they they're getting they have this same 
presentation, he's talking to these road and bridge guys. The uh, if there's an immediate developer, that was their main concern. If somebody immediately wanted to build something, you know, what are our what should we be looking at to reserve for right away? That was the goal, and and David's done a good job putting this together in the staff. But uh, you know, none of these have to be selected. Quite frankly, they could all be on the table depending on what happens there, and that's kind of you know one one way to look at it. Uh, there may be multiple options need to be built because that's a lot of property out there. And that it kind of shows, you know, how they could tie together, you know, maybe slightly different. But the sewer issue, Eric and I have studied as well. And uh, there's a sewer uh, for Taos just very near here. So if you had a facility, uh, you know, not not a big commercial facility like a plant of some kind that uses a lot of water, but a truck stop doesn't use that much water, they could easily put their own small force main into the Taos sewer. And not really spend a lot of money, so they could go ahead and do their thing. Is what my point is, without the city or the county having to put in a bunch of dollars for this. Does not inclusive of sewer money either, by the way. Mm -hmm. Any sewer cost to get there, and so that is still a big hurdle for this property. Mm -hmm. Except, except, but for you could just go ahead and go into Taos, and it's right across the way there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mom, <clears throat> one kind of. I, I believe critical thing that's missing here is is developer input and developer contribution. This looks very similar to kind of edge of town expansions that I've worked on in my past. And and those are largely driven by what the developers need and want and how much they're able to contribute to the project. Because the you know the 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 fact of the matter is is once you put a thoroughfare through a property, you increase that property value. Exponentially, um, you know, it's turned from, you know, kind of flood wasteland into, you know, roadfront property. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, well, well, I certainly appreciate the exercise. The alignment is, is, is a good thing to look about, look at, you know, without some driving information of what needs to go there, what type of population is going to be served, what kind of industry and commercial is going to be served, and, and, and how much these future developments could help contribute to their own infrastructure. Um, a lot of this is a little premature from, from my perspective and my previous experience. And so um, I just don't want anyone to kind of forget about that is this ultimately, um, you, know, you can kind of pick whatever you want alignment here, but if you're not gonna have users on the ends of those, then it's a little bit of a wasted effort. And so you really need those developer input um, not only from uses, but also, you know, what's a reasonable commercially uh, viable contribution from those end users as well. So just kind of wanted to add that to the conversation as well. Yeah, and that's why we wouldn't want to discount some of these. Yeah. You just don't know what's going on there. Yeah, and I think you raised that issue early in the discussion. That's something we need to consider. We also, as Commissioner Otto talked about, connecting point for the greenway so there may be some participation from parks if we put a greenway up along that that road also so yeah that I, I think that's fine but we're just trying to give staff some direction of where we think we're headed councilman did you have any comments councilman buster okay I don't know. Clear as mud. Is there anything else you need from us? Well, kind of have a I, sense from the I, committee. Yeah. Do you need something a little stronger? It, it, well, it sounds like people are pretty interested in wildwood still, even knowing the cost. And it sounds like we have interest in both a stadium project and a Monroe project. And we'll kind of move along with High Street in preliminary design, but. Uh, so what I, what I think I'm hearing, and it doesn't have to be real official, but uh, we would still, we would have to kind of get on with it uh, on the Monroe Street, Street side, as well as the stadium if we're going to apply for that grant. But I didn't hear any negatives about either one, but those are internal workload issues that we'll manage to try to move both of those forward at the same time. So is that? I, I support example B. That's to me, I think kind, of, a kind of in that realm. I mean, yeah. it's, it's fluid. This is like I said, that's why we use the term example. It's not, it's not an exact science here, but. Uh... Yeah, I, I agree too. I mean, we've 
stadium corridor is critical to the city and we've got issues that we've got to agree with, to address and I know Ms. Senzi has been working on some opportunities for us there too. So to me, that one is critical. And again, zero on Monroe Street is not acceptable. We've made commitments there. Again, whether we can get to the 3.5, I think the end by the expressway is critical to the future of our city. I mean, that's an entry point and an exit point for our city. As the councilman indicated, as the school project continues to expand there, Athletic fields are traffic on that. So, I mean, I don't know how we get around doing something there. And again, my preference is if we're going to do it, let's do it right and be done with it and push it forward. So, does that give you enough? I, I think it does. Yeah. We I maybe think, not mud, but no, I think it Missouri gives us River some water. direction. You know, I, if you came in and nobody on this committee wanted to do Monroe Street, that's a different scenario that we work on. But it sounds like that's not the case. Or if you come in and said, "Yeah, mag the stadium thing all together, forget it." Well, that's a different workload scenario. So I'm kind of hearing uh, both of those are still on the table, and uh, we'll still com continue to move those forward, apply for grants as they come up, and see where we go. Okay, that gives us some good direction. Thank you. I don't know where we are on the agenda now. <laughs> uh, we're deep into the clock and we've got people that have to get the jobs and I, I apologize. We've had some critical discussions though. So, you know, to kind of leave it to staff, how quickly we move through. I promised Ms. Senzi we'd get her on before lunch, but I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do that. Well, I can, I can speed it up maybe just because, you know, uh, we're, uh, we're still talking work plan, but other divisions, but airport really, they're working on the tower and, uh, Britt. Brits are point on that, but uh, what we're trying to do is locate additional funding for that tower. We got a partial grant, and so there's nothing needs to happen right of way. I don't believe from this committee is more informational, but that's what our workload is for airport right now is what we're focused on. And we're hoping to see a design agreement and uh, uh, grant agreement in, in the near future on that. Which would on come that to council. Project, which would come to council. And then there's also just, Matt, if I could, I know we're, yeah. we're long. Uh, the other thing is there's some some potential movement in reference to our ARP truck. Uh, ARP truck is a fancy term for fire truck for the airport. Um, and, but the, if we get the truck, we need a we need a building to house it. So that's our second priority at the airport. But we really can't move on to that until we figure out what the grants look like for the tower, because that is our first priority. And Mr. Smith did present that to the airport of the committee on Monday. There was a lot of excitement on that project. The Activity at the airport is up considerably, at least the first couple of months of this year. So, I mean, that is a priority project that we've got to continue to push. So, appreciate staff's work on it. Never miss the opportunity to say the sixth busiest airport in the in the state. I remind people of that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, on the wastewater side of the next one, Eric's here. Uh, you know, we want to talk a little bit about we've got some uh, big projects in the works and the, that would translate into some uh, bonding loan closings. Go ahead, Eric. Right. So um, it's it is informational, but um, we do envision uh, maybe uh, three loan closings in the future. Uh, one uh, by the end of the year, that would be a conventional loan. There's an opportunity to refinance some uh, higher rate that we're paying from a 2014 time and four million dollars in additional. Um, and just and I'm obviously I'm giving you really uh, vague uh, information here. Our financial advisor will be able to uh, give us real numbers and that sort of thing. But they're running three to four percent for a conventional loan, and then the two big state revolving loan fund uh, closings. Uh, those actually have a, a good rate of about 1.6% uh, at this point. So I know um, we'll have a lot of legislation coming forward and we also have to run it by the, the finance uh, committee too, but. Anyway, there's a lot coming there. We just wanna give you a heads up on it. We can talk more about it at another meeting when we have more time if you'd like, but you know, we're working on the biosols project. It's in. It started in that progressive design build project process. 
that's the the big E fourteen million. Um, we're hoping by what the end of uh, end of this year to right. really make make uh, progress where we can know what lock into our number on that. And then the Westview pump station is another pretty good sized project that we need to update. That'll probably go into the following year, but we're hoping for SRF on both of those. And then uh, our uh, consultant had talked to us about this refi just to save money and be able to take that money and use on other projects. So that's kind of the big things going on with that, but just didn't want to gloss over too much. And and uh, if there's any questions, or we can go to the transit one real quick. Okay, I can proceed on. And then transit, Jerry is kind enough to put us a, a uh, sheet in there in your packet on that as well, but there's basically five things and, and they're a little different in transit, but we, we typically get grants for all these things, as you can see there on the sheet. Uh, and so then we match out of those uh, capital improvement funds for transit, but it's everything from, you know, some of the, it's operate equipment, like uh, our bus lift that we're working on presently and uh, even a floor scrubber for our, our facility and then some lighting around the bus shelters, things like that. And then we put a note in there about if uh, paratransit vehicles become available, ours are well past their useful life. So they're really uh, down and being maintained a lot. Uh, and so, but you just can't get the vehicles. So we've talked about ordering the vehicles, but we just can't get the vehicles. So uh, those could pop up. We're hoping those those shake loose and we're able to do that. So that's, that's kind of gives you a flavor of what those CIP funds in transit are being utilized for in the coming year. Okay. And Thank so you. anyway, that's kind of where we're at on that stuff. No, oh, and then, okay, that's all the work plan stuff. <laughs> all right, item five, class section. Proceed, man. So the, you know, PFAS is a big concern nationwide. Uh, luckily, the risk to us is not that uh, big. We do know that we'll have more testing costs and uh, perhaps some um, capital costs in uh, eight to 10 years that will be higher. So there is the opportunity to enter a class action lawsuit. Um, there would be no cost to us and we would uh, be able to recover um, all or most of the, the money we spend to address uh, PFAS and a lot of other uh, long named uh, emergency contaminants that uh, are of a concern. So we would we wouldn't need a resolution to uh, enter into that. And Ryan's looked over the agreement. It doesn't look like they're pulling a fast one. It looks like it's all, uh, you know, no risk to the city and we could get money back if uh, it's successful. And just to tag in a little bit, I think the firefighters Nationwide have already started this lawsuit, and what other class of people uh, group? Uh, oh, the folks who lived on Air Force bases, uh, military farmers. Type. Yeah, there's. Uh, so it's, and that's a, that's a good point. There's some good momentum uh, to to win this. We think, but but the wastewater community hasn't gotten involved, but there's a big push to get them involved. And so I don't know if you know what we're even talking about. It's it makes a lot of headlines and good discussion. People just use that term PFAS. But it's a really a long name chemical, but it's basically any coating uh, coating. You kind of think of the old Teflon type issue is what it is. So DuPont and some of the large companies are who we're talking about have these chemicals and. And uh, anyway, it's going to it's going to trickle back to our plant. All right, so you need action. Well, yeah, this would go to the council to sign the form. So we just thought we'd give you an update on it here first. Like that motion. All right. I second motion. that. And a second. Any other comments, questions? You're comfortable? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Church demolition. So um <clears throat> very pretty close to the Christmas break. Um, well, I jump forward a little bit. It's probably mid. January, so we get a call from um, Missouri American Water saying, "Hey, your guys's water bill for 415 Monroe is suspiciously high." Um, someone might want to go over there and take a look at it, um, and go in there. Uh, and the uh, the bottom floor of the church at 415 Monroe is completely flooded, uh, completely full of water, and we think that it had been flooding since about December 
uh, 27th, which is coincides with a pretty extreme cold weather event, uh, drop and blow was zero. So it looks like a burst pipe that ran for about a month. And, you know, that, that building is not used in any particular regular uh, intervals. And so uh, water ran in there for, we think, about almost a month. Um, and so started filling up a lot of that water. Um, we, we had some assistance from, uh, from public works, help pump, pumping that out. Um, but ultimately the, 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 we think that the building's probably a total loss there because essentially the, the cost to clean up, uh, that, that, that water damage, um, you know, kind of get everything back to the way it should be. Um, exceeds what we think would exceed the amount to just demolish it. And and so this is this event is coupled with the kind of structural and economic reality of that structure. So that structure is an old church, has a sloped floor, and so um it's it's really kind of inconducive for reuse uh for some ADA type uh issues because that sloped floor creates issues. Um you really have to rebuild the structure to bring that <clears throat> to bring that uh, that floor uh, level, and then also there's additional ADA access issues. Uh, so using that for a public facility of any type, um, you'd have to essentially rebuild the entrances to provide appropriate ADA access. And so we think that that building has probably served its useful life, um, really doesn't have any utility to the city other than a very expensive uh, um, to heat and cool and maintain uh, storage locker, and so uh, essentially what we are asking for is is uh, committee uh, input and, and, and then permission to proceed with some demolition. Uh, we had an open open demolition uh, bid procedure um, open back in January, and so we essentially added this as an alternative. Uh, the price to demolish um, is eighteen thousand um, dollars and some change, and as best as um, mitigation, we got a not to exceed amount of $11,700. Um, in reality, that the bestest number we think could probably come in about half that by the $11,000 as a not to exceed number. Um, it would take about two to three we weeks for the asbestos remediation and then demo can follow pretty quickly. Um, but it, it, we didn't want to take that. It is a uh, city owned piece of property. There was previously some CDBG money that was put into it, and so we had some limitations on what we could do with it when we could take it down. Um, we're co we're confident that the time frames have passed, that those CDBG limitations have been released from the property, and so we're kind of free to do whatever we need with it. Um, I think there's probably some lots of uh, valuable and interesting conversations on what we would do with that property after it's demolished. Uh, but kind of in its its current state, I, I think that staff is really doesn't have any particular um, viable ideas for reuse of that structure between the cost of cleaning up the water damage and then making the necessary structural um, uh, kind of improvements necessary to make that a usable public building. Um, you think you could get some better uses out of either, you know, converting that into some more parking or building a new building as opposed to trying to reuse it. It's just, there's just too many pieces of, uh, too many pieces of hair on that particular property that really make it useful for, for reuse. And so, um, I guess we're asking for, uh, permission to, to go ahead and bring the necessary demolition and asbestos contracts, uh, to the city council. Um, we think that there's sufficient funding in, um, in PPS's demolition, uh, budget to take care of this. It's, it's a pretty reasonable, small, uh, demolition and the, uh, kind of overall, um, demolition activities that we undertake. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any feedback. Will there be any community groups concerned about this? Perhaps um, I, I'm not sure how how far this has hit the street. Um, you know, it, it is an old building. Um, I'm not sure of the uh, total kind of historical context of that building, uh, but it's been under city ownership for at least 15 years, perhaps even 20. Um, so it, it's. Uh, 
it's 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 kind of hard to predict on that. So um, I, I don't I'm, know, I don't I'm know if there's support of doing it. I yeah. just want to make sure. I, I, I don't know if there's any been, uh, I don't know if there's any been any uh, particular direct outreach uh, to hmm. to any community groups. Not that we know of. I would just I know you said the the address you said 415. Yeah. Just, so just for clarification, the location of that is just. Right. It's right here on Monroe. Right the it's the little church that's yeah. between the municipal court and the police building. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman Spencer. So um, for short term logistics of that was being currently used for storage. I don't know what it, kind of storage it was, but so where are you going to go with so paper storage? We've already either started or completed that. Um, a lot of the things that we ended up determined that we needed to keep. Um, went back to the Miller Street facilities. Okay. Um, a lot of it, uh, water damage, a lot of it was just lost. Um, lots of lots of papers that were just lost. Um, we were pretty, we have a pretty good level of confidence that nothing critical uh, was lost, just kind of lots of back years of ledgers and just kind of random documents um, from kind of all over the city. But I, I, I've yet to hear anyone saying, oh, no, we were keeping X down there and we're going to be trouble if we lost it. So um, we threw away quite a bit of of of, uh, of of paper material just because it was sitting in water for a month. So being that we own the building, this may lead us to have an opportunity for architectural rehabbers to maybe come in and and you, you take what they think could be salvageable i mean those columns alone are pretty pretty nice columns that i'm gonna bring that up I, I think sorry i was gonna say we I, i'm open to that i think we need to develop a process if that's something that, that we're going to proceed with the demolition i know that there's been a lot of different individuals and groups want different things in there uh, but there may be some benefit to looking at one group and then letting them uh, figure out how to disseminate some of that. But I, I would like to be able to try to allow that. To I occur. would too, if, if that's the direction we need to go. Thank you. All right, we're looking for action if the committee is comfortable. Yeah. Uh, so uh, generally, though, we would want to go through with the asbestos remediation before we let kind of people go in there and start tearing things out. That's fair. Just from a safety standpoint. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm in complete agreement if with, with Mr. Crowell that some sort of formal process or, you know, where we kind of selecting who goes in there and, and making sure that they're, you know, doing it in a, a in a safe way and, a, and selecting those people in a fair way. So. And when, uh, assuming it's approved when it goes on to Cal and the community will have some opportunity for input, which. You just if, need if, to make sure. I was just going to say, if that's the way we're leaning, I would I want to have staff reach out ahead of time and explain Correct. a little bit the what's and the why's for that. But yeah, I appreciate that. <coughs> Feel so inclined to give some direction. Sorry, I would move that we move forward with this the, the demolition with the, the stipulation that. Uh, uh, we do allow, uh, we have public uh, notice and we allow uh, for uh, a process for reclaiming parts of the, that have, may have historical or useful purpose. Yeah. And, and just, I mean, does this require public comment? I mean, it, it doesn't, um, you know, it, it, it it's, uh, would proceed as any other council item, which, you know, each council item has the opportunity for public comment, but not any type of formal public comment. Okay. Well, then I would, I mean, yeah. I'll second that. Cleaned up a little bit. I mean, that was kind of lengthy, you know, but yeah. I'm sure we have it all down. I would just echo though, or follow up with that. We should follow the same kind of criteria that we would require from public buildings, we shouldn't, you know, take advantage of a certain situation. So, um, if if we need to do adequate public notice, I think that's what we should do. Yeah, we should lead agree. by example. I would agree. We have a detailed motion on the table. We have a second. 
All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you much, Councilman. Thank you. I think we've driven away the public, but is there anybody here that would like to speak? All right. Always the best part of the agenda. So we get to our reports, neighborhood services grant update. Yes, thank me. you. And I don't mind going last. Um, so we're just going to run through the, the month's activity since the last time we met. Um, with our EDA, DR, MSP infrastructure grant, um, we're still working through the environmental review process. We've got a smaller working group um, that is solely focused on the PA. Um, and we made a commitment that it would be a draft in draft status at uh, in four weeks, um, which I think we can hit. Um, we've already kind of got a working draft that um, that we're that we're working on. Um, if, so far, the terms of mitigation that are included in that draft include a national register nomination, which we've we've kind of already went down that road, but a completed one. Um, as well as archaeology at the site, ar archaeological monitoring during demolition of the structures that we plan on demoing, and then um, if there's any subsur subsurface deposits that are found, um, then they could go in once the building is down, because those are underneath the buildings are really the only uh, pieces of ground that, that archaeologists aren't sure of, so we, are, we, can, we can work with that. Um, and then other, other ideas are forming throughout that process. Um, there will be a formal grant amendment that will come to council um, once EDA approves because we've kind of blown past, past our timelines. It won't change the budget uh, requirements of it, but it will uh, update those timelines to be more up to speed with the project. Um, I'm not sure when, I, I don't think it'll come in April, but maybe more around the May timeline would, would probably when, be when council would see that. Sure. Well, sorry to ask this question, but where are we at as far as the ho the hotel or development? I mean, how much longer are we going to be? Yeah. So, so my best answer to that is reflected in my previous communication, which I came under a closed cover. Um, I'd be happy to resend that to you, or just have discussion. Nothing has changed, though. Nothing's changed. Um, there are some time frames that are in there that I think the council should be looking at. Um, but I, I I would refer that to back to my closed memo and, and be happy to have any conversations with any any councilor committee members. Um, but one thing that we are currently working on, I think it's fair to say, is trying to decouple the infrastructure work from the hotel and convention center work a little bit. Um, you know, in Chestnut in particular, you know, we have about potentially two hundred million dollars worth of investing investment that is going to be using that. That, that chestnut and so um, and that 200 million dollar of investment is is does not include the hotel and convention center and so we think it makes makes sense to try to loosen some of those bonds uh, between the infrastructure and the uh, and the hotel and convention center just to give a little bit more flexibility on, on really on both ends there so um, that's probably the, the the furthest I can go, kind of on on that particular uh, that 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 particular topic. But like I said, um, referring back um, some deadlines that are upcoming, and and once again, you know, um, I'm happy to have conversations with any council or committee members on on the topic. Okay, um, I'm going to continue on down. Um, our community development block grant, our CDBG entitlement funding, um, we just recently, uh, uh, this week, received our allocation uh, for, for the next year. It's going to be 268000 and some change, uh, which is a little less than what we're normally used to, but we, we can make it work um, for, the, for this upcoming next year. Um, we did um, do our comprehensive annual program evaluation report. We call it the CAPER. We held a public meeting. Um, we are currently in an open comment period through March 19th. Um, and the, the, all that information is available on our website or uh, we have copies at uh, the library here at City Hall, Housing Authority. Um, the overall uh, report is due March 31st. So that's something that staff is working on. Um, we are also working on our consolidated plan. Um, that will be the five-year plan from 2024 to 2029 that each year feeds into. Our next steps um, 
will be to have a public meeting. Would you mind passing these out? Um, thank you. Um, to have a public meeting to discuss the survey results. Um, so when we when we start this consolidated five year planning process, we actually open up a survey to uh, to the public to to ask where do you want this funding to go to um, so what ryan is is passing out right now is is one of the the results from that survey um, we received 91 responses um, and all of the the answer choices that you see listed on on the spreadsheet that was just passed out to you are activities that are eligible um, under the cdbg program um, so we throw literally everything out and see what kind of what see what cream rises to the top so to speak um, so our next step is to have this uh, March 22nd um, at 4 p.m. is to have a public meeting to discuss the survey results. We also take the survey results and match them up with planning documents that we already have approved um, to figure out where where we can invest uh, public dollars wisely. Um, that is, you know, if I could pick out a meeting of all, I know we have a lot of meetings with CDBG, but this one would be the 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 number one. This is the most important meeting. Um, that you could attend because it's dictating where the next five years it's going to go. Um, once we have that meeting, we'll go through the survey results, we'll go through the planning documents, and the, based off of those results is how staff then turns around and drafts this five-year plan. Um, so we, we're going to uh, issue a press release um, to try to get as much public involvement um, probably next week, um, maybe even this week, um, to get, get as Get as much input as we can into into this process um, and then just a sneak peek um, so in thinking about it what what was passed out to you you can see that the homeless facilities had the the highest ranked need next to second came street improvements child care centers uh, construction of housing and then demolition would have been the top five um, that we're going through Um, CDBG CARES Act, if you'll remember, this is where what we used our CARES Act funding to go uh, through for child care facilities. Um, extensions were given to the Boys and Girls Club and Early Explorers. Um, those are the only two out of 11 that we funded that are still working on their projects. Early, Early Explorers is doing a building expansion, so theirs is a little bit more complicated than the rest of them. Um, I do want to highlight child care for just a moment, just just because I want to make sure that it's on your radar. Um, child care centers on the survey ranked number three, and then child care services also ranked number 14. Um, when we did the CARES Act, I don't think child care was on our radar. Um, recently, ha it has come up, um, and, it, and, it, and I, it's going to be a big deal. Um, and it's just something that we need to be aware of um, because of in the lack of infant care across the city. Um, what we do know, um, we've kind of run some statistics and worked with other organizations. Um, we have 32 licensed daycare facilities in Jefferson City right now. Um, what we do know is that 23 temporarily or permanently closed during the pandemic. Um, some of them didn't come back. Um, we know at least six, um, but then there's been a couple that have opened since then. Um, the state has unleashed some of the ARPA funding for child care relief and startup grants to connect businesses with child care providers. Um, and there's also a workforce group, um, kind of the same workforce group that's working on housing. There's also a section that's working on child care. Um, one of the concerns that's that's occurring is the business model for child care facilities is set up on where the child care facility would accept a loss for infant care because it would be subsidized by by older children. Um, if we have more pre-K centers, which is a great thing to have, the fallout of that is now no longer your child care businesses don't, don't have a business model that works. Um, so we think that, you know, within the next, I mean, probably right now, um, that there's gonna be a little bit of a child care crisis, especially when you're talking about uh, infant care. CDBGDR, um, we are actively working on that. Um, I know I've received a couple of, of requests from, from council. Um, some of those programs that's on city staff to start working on and getting that out, including um, you know, the, the homeowner repair that I talked with Councilman Lester about. 
Um, the infrastructure, uh, Councilman Spencer had, had requested that information. We have a meeting with uh, state staff next week to kind of unveil that policy. That way, once we understand the policy and how it works, then we can create a program that will, that will implement that. Yeah, yeah, and the background on that, uh, quite frankly, was I think the mayor was on some radio program last week, and she wasn't aware that we had any of those funds, which was surprising. So I just wanted to make sure that we got that out, that we still have those funds available, and uh, that they're they're just uh, we just haven't come up with a spending plan. We do, and I and I've been I've been having that uh, conversation with folks as well because of the MHDC pro proposals. There was a misconception that that funding was just gone, um, and that's not the case. We just have to shift. Um, we do one one thing I did want to bring up that we've worked on is the planning. We have two hundred fifty thousand um, that's required for planning. Um, we held a kickoff meeting with DED last month, and we talked about possible projects. Um, in the in the plan, it talked about a community resiliency, but really, it's any it's anything that could support um, recovering from the tornado. And one of the things that we came up with um, was to do a kind of a full uh, look take a peek at our zoning code. Um, that's something that was identified in our housing needs assessment is, is looking at our zoning code and seeing if we can streamline housing develop, streamline economic development, um, you know, and asking that question, are we, are we, are we unintentionally doing it to ourselves? Are there, th are there things that we can clean up to make that process a little bit better? Um, obviously wanna wait until we get our new uh, director of PPS to get, get him involved in that. Um, but that is that is something that is possible with this funding. Um, we've also talked about updates to hazard ha the hazard mitigation plan, um, and there's other possibilities with stormwater, fire, police, county, um, to kind of work off of more and lean more into that resiliency uh, type of planning. Um, our Paul Brune. Uh, grants are currently, we're working on them. A lot of them have come out of their environmental review phase and they're gonna go into their design review phase. Um, so we're really working with um, the applicants on uh, making sure that they understand the procurement process. Um, I would say two of them are kind of familiar and the rest of it's, it's abnormal to have to go through these types of hoops. Um, but that's currently where we're at with that one. Um, we did have a site visit to the to 200, 206 to 210 East High Street of the J.C. Penney building um, yesterday just to kind of work out some of their issues. Um, we're also, all of the properties as a condition of accepting the grant funds have to enter into a conservation easement, which is a historic preservation easement. They have to, one, one has to sign a five-year easement and the rest have to sign 10 as a condition of preserving their buildings for that long. Um, we're currently scoring bids for design guidelines as well as the West Main Phase Two architectural survey. Um, so we should have contracts coming to council shortly for that. Um, the EMS uh, facility has completed its environmental review record, um, it, as we mentioned at last you know, council, the last council meeting. Um, once that is is completed and the state approves, there's a there's kind of a concurrent public comment period. Um, that the county will put out a 15-day comment period, and then the state will put out a 15-day public comment period once that once that is issued. Um, then there will be the authority to use grant funds, and that's essentially the notice to proceed on that project. So that's coming along. Um, state CDBG CV. Um, really, the activity that's occurred here is Compass Health is now coming working on their planning project. We held their kickoff meeting last last month. Um, and we're still going through the environmental phase with transformational housing and an MOA. Uh, pending applications, uh, we did submit um, a grant to the Mid-Missouri Solid Waste Management District. We requested 25,000 to repair the and paint the three remaining glass recycling bins. Um, we did score number one um, for those, so it sounds like it's a positive thing, but we do have to wait for DNR approval. Um, ARPA funding. Um, so we submitted the community revitalization grant. Um, that was for $2.1 million. We were leveraging our EDA grant as match. Um, it sounds very positive. Um, we did have a follow-up meeting with DED and they requested to clean up our application a little bit and indicated that announcements would be forthcoming in the next couple of weeks. 
I have not heard anything about the local tourism grant. Um, and then all, you know, again, all these other funding mechanisms that are coming down. I think one of the conversations that we've that we've had, you know, ind independently with with folks is the, you know, the High Street Viaduct has a high potential um, for some federal and or state uh, grant funding. Um, I think it's a really good project to cherry pick, and if you know, pursuing that funding um, and achieving that funding would 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 maybe create a release valve on some of the the budgeting issues. Um, but one of the things that's required of all federal funds um, with that kind of is a benefit cost analysis. Um, so having that um, that package ready as part of that planning um, could get your application ready by the time that opportunity opens. And that's um, that's it. Yeah. I'd be happy to answer any questions. As always, thanks for a very comprehensive report. Any questions, comments? Unfortunately, we've run out of agenda. So if, if somebody wants to make a motion, Councilwoman Wiseman's not here to help us out. So. I will make that motion to adjourn. Thank you very much. Thank you to the staff and for everybody. I appreciate it. We are adjourned. <laughs>